Okay, good evening everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. Um, you, we do have our number one land. Uh, before we start, we acknowledge, we acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the tradition, traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nation. So call to order, I, like many others, attended the past week at the uh, East Link Center and up at the Cup Credit Union Place. Um, it was a, a great series, a great uh, event for the city, for the province. And it went over, covered the past 10 days. Saw some great, amazing young um, hockey, potential hockey stars. Um, one of the sc school, uh, school programs that we brought in, about 3,500 went to the East Link Center to uh, watch the, uh, the game. More than 44,000 fans purchased tickets at the Cup and at the East Link Center. Um, over 70% of minor hockey players on Prince, Edward Island, on Prince Edward Island were able to attend at least one game free of charge. And Bruce Donaldson, the volunteer extraordinaire, sent, uh, sent, sent me an email. I'm ready to extend my deepest gratitude for the generous support that the city of Charlottetown has provided to the U, the World U Under-17 World uh, Hockey Challenge. Uh, your dedication to make it a positive impact in our in our community is evident, and we are proud to have the city as a key partner. On a personal no note, and I second it, a special shout out to Wayne Long, Laura Lee, uh, Charlotte Nicholson, and all the other volunteers that showed up to uh, be part of this great event. And uh, if you didn't make it Saturday night for the final game, the gold medal game, I think we have a little clip, do we not? Yep. So we just brought in a clip from uh, from the from the game, uh, the, the, the the goal, the, the final goal. <laughs> so the place was packed to the rafters. And it was 2-1 overtime period. Um, just a spectacular end to this world under-17 hockey challenge. So, Councillor McKinnon, just a great job on the part of the department. And, uh, well, again, it's a big shout-out. Councillor Ramsey, did you want to say something? Hold on. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh so it looked like the days where Alex got the, he, when we coached him in the midget there, when he got the winning goal. The crowd was so big there. But not take away from that, uh, I spent a lot of time this past week also at the national tournament in Summerside for the, for the women's soccer, and I'm proud to say Holland College got the bronze medal. <clears throat> it's their highest standing they ever had in their school. They went undefeated in their crossover game. It was a shootout to get them the gold medal game. And there was about six or seven shooters on each side, and they lost to that one. But they turned around and they came back very strong on Saturday, and they won the gold medal. So I'd like to say congratulations to the coaching staff, all the young ladies that played in Holland College School, and my granddaughter. Well Thank done. You. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Okay, any declarations of conflict of interest? See you not. On the agenda, we have the reports, adoption minutes. Good to go. Okay, moved by Councillor Ramsey. Yes, sir. Okay, second by Councillor McKinnon. All those in favor? And Councillor, um, we have Councillor um, 
Beck calling in because he's out of the province. Councillor Beck, no problem? Uh, all good, yeah. Okay. So we have three sets. No, actually, more than that. We have regular monthly meeting October 10th, special meetings 12th, October 12th, 23rd, at November 2nd, and a planning meeting on November 1st. Need someone to move those minutes? Councillor McKinnon, Councillor McTart, all those in favor? Councillor Beck, yay, nay? In favor. Okay. Business arising from the minutes. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the first report, and it's planning and heritage, and I believe we have Michael Fraser, who is a new planner from the, with the De Department of Planning, Development, and Heritage. Welcome, Michael. So he'll try to answer any backup questions for the chair, if, if need be, but uh, we'll uh, let you go with your report. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. The uh, Welcome, everybody. The Planning and Heritage Committee um, did not meet since the last council meeting, um, so therefore there's no minutes or report in your package. The Planning Board met on November the 7th, so the minutes and report is in your package. The Heritage Board has not met since our last council meeting, but we are meeting this Thursday at noon. The Design Review Board met on October 30th, so again, copies of the minutes and report is in your package. The Affordable Housing Advisory Committee met on October 17th, and again, copies of the minutes are in your package. Um, we have six resolutions to be forwarded um, from Planning and Heritage for this evening for your consideration, and we also have one first reading. And just for, um, in terms of information purposes, you can see the list of the October um, permits in, the, in your package as well. <coughs> And other than that, if anyone has any questions, I will do my best to answer. And we also have um, Michael here pinch hitting for our managers this evening. So thank you, folks. Councillor Tweel. Thank you for your report, uh, Deputy Mayor Jankoff. Um, with the, the recent announcement of the provincial government looking to relocate the outreach center down to um, Beach and Park Street. Uh, it's, it's quite intriguing that this announcement was made and once again the way it's being portrayed in the media is that it's up to City Council to make the decision. Council has to approve a temporary, a temporary um, variance which will enable the uh, province to relocate the outreach center uh, down in that particular location. And just picking up on some of the comments that are made on the floor of the legislature, uh, you know, the Premier talks about collaboration. We're going to collaborate. New word, collaboration. And, you know, we're going to reach out to the community, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but the final analysis, once again, when it comes down to the technical aspect of things, it's a city of Charlottetown that has to embark upon that process. Unlike what took place up on Houston Street, where there was no process, there was no discussions, there was no collaborations. We're just going to plunk it here, and the residents in that community, after two and a half years, were basically under siege were held hostage to uh, some of the clients from the outreach center. It's well documented. We can, we can do an inventory. Uh, it's been talked about in the media, but nonetheless, uh, that's what's been happening as well as the distribution of drug paraphernalia. So in the spirit of collaboration as the Premier, to use his words, and some of his uh, members of ca Cabinet, I would challenge the Premier in terms of collaboration and collaborating with the community to book, a, book a, a town hall meeting or a public meeting at Birchwood Junior High School and for the Premier to show up along with his members of Cabinet, senior, senior administration, and for them to explain 
this so-called new concept, new model, to the community. Because the community wants to have an opportunity to ask the Premier and members of the Cabinet and members of, of his senior bureaucracy questions and direct questions. Stop hiding behind City Council and the administration here. That's getting old. So when I hear about collaboration, I'm all for collaboration. I've always have been. But don't preach it on the floor of the Legislative Assembly. Don't tell me, show me. Don't tell me, show me. So I'm hoping that the Premier, before we get down to the nitty gritty here of going through the process through the planning, uh, planning uh, staff <clears throat> to planning board, public meeting, and then council having to vote, and the torpedoes pointed at us, either way, I've always said this, they're playing chess, we're playing checkers. So um, I, I wanted to bring that to your attention as the chair of planning. I know you have a difficult job. Uh, I, I, I uh, know it's, it's an erroneous task, but uh, this is not a criticism of you or your planning board or the staff, but it's always the city of Sherrilltown that's under the gun. And like I said, it's getting old. It's time for the provincial government or the premier and his cabinet book a public meeting at Birchwood Junior High School and I'll guarantee you the community will show up. It's about time they, they're there in person to answer the questions. So I wanted to bring forward that recommendation and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that, that the Premier will act on that recommendation in the spirit of collaboration to galvanize and empower the people. We want to we want to hear what the people have to say. Well, stop hiding behind city council and you face the community directly. After two and a half years of the torment, torture, the neighborhood being under siege, being held hostage by what's been happening at the outreach center, I would think that you owe the taxpayers that much. That's not an unreasonable request. So uh, I wanted to bring that forward, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor of Atlanta, and I'm very, very serious about this recommendation, and so is the community. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to answer? Do you want to answer? Um, thank you, thank you, Councillor Twill, for your your um, your thoughts and input, and um, I I appreciate um, your passion on this file, and um, I can say that. As uh, you know, as a council, we um, you know we have, and as the planning and heritage department, we our role is land use and community impact, and we have a zoning and development bylaw that we is our guiding light, in, in, including our official plan. So I do know that the application from the province has been submitted at the end of the day today for a temporary variance for. Um, um, a temporary uh, variance to uh, relocate uh, their um, provincial outreach center to the Park Street location. Um, the all the at this stage, the only thing that has happened is that the application has been submitted. Um, I don't have any other um, information on it. However, Michael is here. If there is any other um, um, information that you want taken back to staff prior to that, okay. Thank you, Councilor Tart. <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you to Councillor Tweel um, for bringing that recommendation forward. I certainly fully support um, uh, public engagement on this particular file. Uh, as soon as the announcement was made about the potential for Park Street to be, or sorry, the Outreach Centre to be relocated to Park Street, um, you know, you could imagine the amount of emails and phone calls that I received. But one of the uh, common themes of, of the discussions that I've had was, uh, yet again, the lack of um, consultation with the, with the public and, and the people who are most impacted by that. Uh, you know, we're, we're going on um, our fourth kind of uh, permit down around that site. We've had uh, two variances for the shelter. We've had an overdose prevention variance. Now we're going at mm -hmm. a outreach center variance. And uh, there has been, uh, by all accounts, um, not a lot of community consultation where the residents feel they have the ability to ask questions, get answers, and face the uh, uh, the applicant in that manner. So to the chair, 
Uh, now that you've announced that the application has been submitted for the uh, Outreach Center for Park Street, I will ask that you, as well as the chair for the planning board, uh, I think the last mechanism we had here, we, we allowed the public to come here and, and basically state, but the applicant was not here in, in person to address questions. I strongly suggest that we look at that model to determine um, more engagement if, it, if uh, Councillor Tweel's uh, recommendation is not granted for a, for a full-fledged public meeting that um, somewhere like Birchwood or, or other uh, locations where they can come in and speak to. Uh, so I, I want to say that I, I stand behind that recommendation as well. Uh, and secondly, my question is looking for an update and recognizing that we have somebody new here tonight, so not likely to have any answers, but nonetheless, I'll put forward, uh, as you know, we have the uh, Park Street shelter variants uh, actively um, being worked on as a file. And when that came in a month ago or more, when and we decided to move that forward, it was under the terms and conditions of about six provisions. Um, I am looking for and uh, seeking an update on where those are. Um, I do drive, reg <coughs> excuse me, I do drive by the uh, shelter, um, you know, to check on progress and, and, that's, and I have not seen any of the fencing or the walkway. I'm not sure where we stand with the uh, sprinkler system. That was obviously a, a hot topic at the time when we were talking about that. So if you could find that out for me, uh, I'll ask you here today. If you have the answers, that's great. If not, if you could bring that back, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Matart, for your questions. And I, I would suspect all of us would love to see um, more public consultation on any decisions that we make as a council and um, and hopefully we will have the public consultation that you folks are looking for and the rest of us are looking for and as for an update on the Park Street shelter variance we do have an update our city solicitor is here today and um, she can share that with us all thank you okay Melanie do you want to just give us an update please Sure, I don't know if you need me to stand. Thanks, <laughs> Councillor Yankov. Um, not a fulsome substantive update, but uh, myself and my colleague, Mr. Hooley, have met with the heads and managers of the various departments that those six conditions apply to. Uh, we actually have a meeting later in the week to follow up on each of those conditions. So while I don't have a substantive update on each of them, uh, we are meeting with the department heads on Thursday, I believe, and uh, we'll have a better update at that time as to the status of everyone's um, correspondence with the government on the satisfaction of those conditions. Just as a follow-up to our city solicitor, um, I believe the deadline is December the 6th. So are you anticipating or maybe, Michael, are you anticipating that this will be completed by December the 6th? <clears throat> I don't mean to put you on the nope. spot if you can't answer no. that. Uh, I'm hoping that on Thursday we will have a more realistic view of um, how and when slash if those conditions will be met by December 6th. But when we met um, a while ago, that was the goal. Okay. Oh, the 16th. The 16th. Council McLear. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brown. Uh, just going to digress uh, here on another subject in, in Atlanta. And also, I guess it uh, covers uh, pre perhaps uh, Fire and Protective Services. But uh, in relates to uh, an email that uh, Justin Matert uh, sent uh, sent to uh, circulated to Council and the Mayor regarding excess uh, occupancy uh, in the city and, and residents and uh, Justin, just kind of quote in the first part of your email because uh, it's certainly uh, a concern, uh, very much that's going on, uh, going on in my ward as well. Um, and uh, as, as you said, I'm reaching out this evening regarding several concerns that have been brought to my attention. I'm confident many of you have same concerns in your wards. We are seeing there are many situations where excessive amounts of people are occupying individual homes and apartments throughout the city. For instance, I have a home in Ward 2 where it's perceived that at least eight people are living and occupying a standard three-bedroom bungalow without the egress windows in the basement, and the concern is uh, certainly one of safety and fire. So 
Uh, and, and again, I know um, uh, I, I know in my own uh, I know in my own ward uh, there were several cases, and uh, one uh, one party in particular on uh, on Hunters Creek, where there's a property where there's a history uh, going over well over uh, well over a year now. Uh, the city planning staff and fire people know this uh, know this situation, but it's it is a situation that. Uh, you know where, uh, where 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 homes, residences. In this particular case, uh, there's a property. Uh, you know, in our neighborhoods, a two-story uh, two-story home, uh, four bedrooms upstairs. That's that's had uh, had uh, situations where there's been locks on the doors and uh, uh, rooms been rented out, and and certainly not meeting the the spirit and standards of uh, you know for our one neighborhood. Uh, parking has been a nightmare in a lot of cases. I've witnessed it myself. There's six, seven cars, not enough room for them to park on the driveway. So where do they park? They park on the front lawn and they park on on neighbors' lawns. And so it 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 is. Uh, I'm sure this is uh, you know a spillover of uh, housing shortages. But these sorts of things are going on. These examples are going on right across the city. And um, I, I think it's. Uh, and I just like to ask. I know it has been raised. Um, where that is going in terms of uh, uh, future um, um, uh, changes, or what can be, uh, what um, remedies there may be to uh, to address this uh, this concern. Thank Deputy you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McAleer, for your question. The uh, this is actually one of the first items on our next Planning and Heritage Committee meeting. It was to have taken place last month, but unfortunately due to some staffing concerns, we weren't able to meet. And so it is um, one of the first items on the agenda to discuss, looking at, and we'll, the staff will prepare a report for us on what our options are, whether it's changes to the zoning and development bylaw, um, et cetera. So um, I hope to have more information in the coming weeks on this ongoing um, struggle that I'm hearing from all councillors in each of the wards. So thank you for your question, and thank you, Councillor Matart, for the email that you sent on this item as well. Okay, Councillor Matart, do you want to follow up? Uh, I do. Just uh, going back on my last comment on the um, for legals uh, update regarding the December sixteenth deadline. I quote: "You indicate we'll have a more realistic view by Thursday. So, what is the city?" I think realistically that, that we're four weeks away from that time frame. What is the realistic view and what is the city prepared to do as a result of these terms and conditions not being met? Some of these terms and conditions are serious in nature. We have a sprinkler system. We had policing involved in there. I hate to note, but we, we had a recent incident that occurred down on the Park Street uh, vicinity. Um, the near resulted in a death. Um, of somebody in a tent. So these terms and conditions are serious and they're required and they should be in place. And I, you know, I think that the, there was a, an opportunity there where there was a time when they thought that they might have about a month to implement these and uh, through some technicalities of the time the permit was issued, they have till December 16th. So I'm, I'm not sure when we talk about what the realistic view is, if, you know, and then we're coming into the Christmas, December season and the cold weather's coming and et cetera. So I, I would really like to know what we are planning to do as a city if there's these terms and conditions are not met by the 16th. Deputy Mayor. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matard. And I would uh, continue to be cautiously optimistic that that the conditions will be will be met by December 16th in spirit of of the ongoing um, additional applications that are coming forward this way. Um, and I would think that if the if there's an update from our city solicitors this week, I would think we'd be able to bring this forward to our next special meeting of council for we an will. update. Yeah, we have a fourth Monday. Yep, the yep. fourth Monday. So. Yep, so thank you. Yep. And Melanie, you already said that you're meeting this week? Correct, yeah. Okay, Councilor Tweel. Regarding the extension to the um, temporary variance for the shelters down at the end of Park Street, I think one of the commitments that the province made was they were going to uh, 
make a contribution and fund four police officers. Correct me if I'm wrong, but so they, they two was supposed to be dedicated to the outreach center and four police officers were supposed to be contributed on staff, four new police officers, not what we have, but four new police officers. That, my math tells me that's six, six police officers. And regarding the four police officers that the province had committed to, uh, was there a memorandum of understanding signed between the city of Charlottetown and the provincial government, clearly illustrating the commitment that the provincial government made for the four additional police officers to police that particular area, that community, because of things that have happened over the last year or so. Uh, we saw the uh, outrage at the Confederation Center meeting. I mean, that was quite clear. Um, people were, were, were upset. Uh, they were, they were, they were um, felt neglected. And uh, resolution was passed here. Uh, recently, so I'm looking for a status report as to where we are at with the four additional police officers that the provincial government committed to, and was there a memorandum of understanding signed with the city of Charlottetown, clearly illustrating that commitment? Okay, so deputy, we do have the police chief here. He's he has, I believe. No, that's plain. That's on the plan. No, 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 no. The police chief is overseeing the policing. Uh, funding. Was made on the planning. Yeah. Was so, for planning. so the police chief, if he can just address the numbers he's talking about, is that all right, uh, deputy? Police chief uh, McConnell, can you just turn on the mic there? Clarify the math. Yes, your worship. Um, yeah, perhaps I could probably. So. We did, as a police service, put forth a proposal to the government uh, last year regarding uh, safe spaces for everyone proposal where the government did fund two, two officers for a year funding. Um, and, uh, and there is two other officers funded through the Mobile Mental Health Initiative from the province. Um, now, conversations regarding the... Uh, the uh, extension of the uh, housing to Park Street um, added an additional two officers to that committed to the Safe Spaces Initiative. So it's not four in total, it's, it's an extension, another year extension of the first two, and then adding another two um, for, uh, for, um, for Park Street or the areas of influence which is, you know, broader than just Park Street. It's, uh, it's, it, it occupies a large part of the, the downtown. So um, I hope that uh, provides some clarity. Yeah. Yeah, Councilor Twill, what's your point of order? Point of order is, Chief, with all due respect, yeah. we had two that was already committed for the outreach center. It was supposed to be there patrolling uh, that particular neighborhood. And then, as I understood it, when we passed the resolution, when council, majority of council, passed a resolution, the commitment was for an additional four police officers. It wasn't uh, just two and four in total. My math tells me it was four additional police officers. That's the way I understood it. Okay? I don't think I'm wrong. So if you go back and look at that resolution, and if we were to prove the OPS, if council was to prove that, then it would have been six. So the way I understood it was four additional police officers for down at Park and Beach Street. Two was already committed for, for the outreach center on Houston and an additional four. That's the way I understood it. And I didn't hear any different when that resolution and those discussions took place. Okay. So I'm asking again, where is the four police officers from the provincial government, okay. just the additional four Dep police officers. Deputy, just, just once more, Chief, can you clarify what he's, uh, I, I, I think I understand the math. The extension is yeah, not it, an additional, it's just an extension of the, the service. Exactly. In fact, it is four officers because the funding would have expired this year and those two officers would have 
not been uh, available. So the extension is for four officers for another year. So, but that will only amount to two new hires. Yeah. And if we add our six additional six, that would be six plus four. Deputy, do you want to have uh, any other concluding remarks? I think I was just going to explain the same thing. There were, we had, um, there were two last year when we approved the first year of the shelter, and those are extended for another year while, while they have another final temporary um, approval for the variance. Then there were the um, two renewals for the outreach center, and then so there's two brand new hires. So there will be six, but two of them were already there and the other two were already there. Um, Did you say six? Yeah, so two, two are with the mobile, um, mobile unit that um, patrols the outreach center. Two were um, hired last year for the area of, that's impacted where the shelters are. And so then this year the approval includes the extension of the two for the mobile unit. So that's and two for the extension for the temporary shelters and two additional new ones to cover the impacted areas. No, I think that, no, just, 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 just redo the math there, Chief. Yeah, so it, again, it's, it's two, two officers were hired um, in response to the safe spaces proposal uh, that we submitted to the province. The recent agreement extended those two officers for an additional year and added two more officers with the extension of the Park Street Housing Project, which totals four. Yeah. There's two other officers for the mobile mental health, which is a separate agreement. Okay. Okay. Can we move on to the resolutions? Please. You want to go with the first one? Planning one? You ready? Yeah. Thanks, Chief. The first planning resolution, Your Worship, is moved by Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe. Resolved that the application submitted by the owner's agent, Tessa Roberts, Robert Group of Companies, and subsequent traffic study prepared by Coles Associates Limited and N Globe Corp dated August 25th, 2023, for the development of a drive through and queuing spaces at 644 University Avenue, PID number 387 852, for a Tim Hortons eating and drinking establishment, be accepted. Questions called? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yay. All those against? <clears throat> okay, 10 0. Resolution number two from Planning Your Worship, moved by Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe, be it resolved that the request to amend Appendix A, the future land use map of the City of Charlottetown's official plan from industrial to medium density residential and a request to amend Appendix G, zoning map of the City of Charlottetown's zoning and development bylaw from light industrial zone M1 to medium density residential zone R3 for the property located at 68 Royalty Road, PID number 145714 be approved to proceed to public consultation. Question? Okay, it's going to public consultation. This is all. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yay. Okay. The third resolution, Your Worship, is. Okay, just one second. Did you put negative? You were against? Yeah. Going to public consultation? 9 1. Resolution, a third resolution from Planning Your Worship, moved by Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe, be resolved that the request to rezone the property located at Lot 39 Oak Drive, PID number 392936, from single detached residential zone R1L to low density residential zone R2, to allow the construction of a duplex dwelling subject to the following condition that the applicant be required to provide all necessary documents to the satisfaction of the City of Charlottetown for the future building and development permit application to ensure that the proposed duplex dwelling is located and constructed on the subject property at an adequate distance from the existing drainage pipe found along the rear property boundary, 
boundary be approved. Okay, Councillor McCabe. The system has detected just, that just a few lines second. are still connected to the conference the and system. will attempt to disconnect them. If you wish to remain in the conference, please press star one. Fifteen. Okay, press star. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we had this kind of discussion um, already at Planning Board, but I just kind of wanted to remind us that we had a good uh, discussion at our public meeting on this property that we were going to look in and find out, uh, get some clarification around what's happening as far as the piping and whose responsibility um, the piping was. We had a little bit of background that maybe it wasn't quite as clear that was presented at our public meeting, but I just want to make sure it's on public record that that's not forgotten in this process as we move this forward. I know it doesn't directly impact the application, but we just don't want to forget about that. Deb, do you want to add to that? I, I, I think you heard just it also. To, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just to build on what Councillor McCabe has said, yeah, it was it was made um, clear at the public meeting that the manager of planning and heritage was going to look into this and that it did, would not disrupt the um, change of the for this developer to build his duplex because it's not really his responsibility. It is the responsibility of whoever was responsible at the time and empowered to actually put this drainage in. And it's the understanding of the residents that it was done by the city of Charlottetown. So the um, developer um, or the uh, planner is looking into that, and you're right, it, it, um, it's good that it is on public record because we do need to look out for the rest of those residents, including the resident that's building the duplex. So thank you for that. Councilor Ron. Thank you, Mayor Brown. And I, I listened to uh, the developer talk that night at the meeting, and here we are faced with a housing crisis, and there's an open parcel of land here, and, and uh, he's willing to, you know, get a duplex for a couple of families in a nice school area where they could walk to school. I think, uh, you know, everything that, that was asked of him, he, he answered the questions. Uh, it's our drainage issue, and, it, and it'll go behind his building. He's not going to affect any of the the um, drainage issues with the pipe. You know, he's going to be well ahead of that. So I think it's a great development, and, a, and I applaud him for uh, moving forward for this and, and making a, uh, two homes for two families in, our, in this area. Thank you. Uh, Deputy, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Duran. I think I think it's clear too that mo most people are quite, you know, applauding the developer for what he's doing, and making sure too that the responsibility of this drainage pipe is not put on this developer, but put on um, the uh, probably the city of Charlottetown if it was them that installed it. So um, thank you for reiterating that as well. Okay. Questions called. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councilor Beck, yay or nay? In favor. Okay. Uh, Sue Fraser, next one, please. The fourth planning resolution, Your Worship, moved by Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe. We are resolved that the request for a site specific exemption to Section 30.2 regulations for permitted uses in Section 30.3 bonus height development standards in the downtown mixed use neighborhood DMUN zone of the zoning and development bylaw to increase the height of the proposed apartment building from six stories to eight stories with a maximum height of 88 feet in the downtown mixed-use neighborhood zone DMUN for the property located at 199 Grafton Street, PID number 342790 for the proposed eight-story, 158-unit building including 32 affordable housing units with parking located within and under the building at 199 Grafton Street, PID number 342790, subject to the Design Reviews Board's recommendations be approved to proceed to public consultation. What's that? Questions called? Okay, great. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Uh, yay. Yay. Okay, 10, ten zero. The fifth resolution from planning, Your Worship, moved by Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe, be it resolved that the request to amend Appendix A, future land use map of the City of Charlottetown from low density residential to commercial, 
and amend Appendix G zoning map of the City of Charlottetown zoning and development bylaw from low density residential zone R2 to highway commercial zone C2 for the portion of the property located at 421 St. Peter's Road, PID number 464586 be approved to proceed to public consultation. Okay. Councilor McCabe. Thank you. I just want to point out that it's still the wrong ward on the application. I pointed that out at planning board. It's ward eight. It's supposed to be ward nine, um, which is my ward. And I, I guess I was a little bit surprised to see another application for this um, business at the, two years after we went through quite a process with the residents in the area who, you know, were indicated that with the new roundabouts and everything that there'd be no more application for a while. We made their parking lot zone parking lot and no trucks were going to use Angus Drive and everything was going to be uh, tickety-boo and happy, no increase in traffic. And, and I can tell you that that's not the case. We see trucks driving Angus Drive. We're not able to monitor. We're not able to control that. Um, residents are still de dealing with that. And here we are less than two years later again looking for another rezone. And not just a rezone. I know it's the property next door, but rezone to a C. C2 Highway Commercial, which pretty much means as soon as we give application for this property to be rezoned C2 Highway Commercial, there's about 95 different permitted uses that these people will be able to then never have to come back to council and look for permission to do anything if they meet one of the 950 possibilities for this area. I've recommended that maybe they go back and look at a site specific variance to allow for a drive through if that's what they want to do is work and put a drive through in with Tim's and have enough land to have a dual thing. But the minute we approve this land use change, it's free for all. And I'm really, really not in favor and would hope that you remember how much we already put the residents in that area through. Um, I won't be supporting this application to move forward. I understand it's just public consultation, but even to have to put these people through another process of that, I don't think it's fair. Thank you. Councilor Tweel. I, I too will not be supporting this. Uh, I know the residents in Angus Drive, uh, since council overturned the 8-1 vote and concluded with a 6-3 vote to approve the uh, the entrance and exit on Angus Drive, which changed the complexion and the entire dynamic of that street. Uh, I know people live in that street for approximately 50 years and never had that kind of traffic, never had to experience that. They, uh, they constructed their homes, built there, raised their families so that they could live a nice, peaceful, quiet, predictable life with practically no traffic whatsoever. When it comes to highway traffic commercial, I know all about it. I grew up on a street that had highway traffic commercial, so I know what that's all about. I mean, you want to locate there, that's fine. But uh, I do know that um, a resident just recently passed away, lifelong resident, lived in St. Peter's Road, that had to, uh, had to experience, negatively experience all that traffic, uh, basically lost the comfort of her, uh, her front lawn, driveway, everything changed. And uh, the poor woman, you know, she's lived there too for a number of decades and just before her very eyes, her, her neighborhood changed. So, you know, it's, that's what, what happens when you get down this road and you put a, put a pathway or driveway on, on, a, on a residential street. I said at the time, no um, urban planner worth their salt would ever, ever, ever recommend highway commercial on a neighborhood street. So nothing against the uh, prop, the business owner personally, but you know, that this fabric, uh, the fabric of this neighborhood has changed and changed dramatically. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot going on. It's a very successful business, but it's it's changed the dynamics of that neighborhood, and I really don't think that's fair. Okay. To be honest with you, I don't think it's fair, okay. and I can't good conscience support thank, it either. Thank you, Councilor Twill. Councilor Bernard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, 
And, and Councilor McKay brings up a good point. I'm just wondering though, I, I think in the past when, when we've had these type of situations, we were able to do a development agreement which, which doesn't open up that whole zone. It's just, it's just for what they're asking for. I think it was to make two lanes into the uh, drive-through. Um, but to go, to go the uh, highway commercial does open up a lot of doors. So I'm just wondering, um, in the past we've done development agreements that, that holds them to just that in the uh, highway commercial. Is that still doable today? So if, if, it was, if it was to pass, there would be a development agreement that it would be for the drive-through lane only. I'm just curious, is that still doable? Deputy, do you want to take that on or do you want to defer it to Michael? What's, what's your, what is your call? Okay, thank you, um, Your Worship, and thank you for your question, Councilor Bernard. Um, I will defer the question on whether or not these types of um, stipulations can be put into a development agreement, but I can also caution us folks that the last application that we approved with a development agreement that encouraged no truck traffic to go in and around the residential area, that's happening on a regular basis. So um, anyways, Michael, if you can speak to the, um, the, the willingness or the ability for us to um, put together a development agreement that would be that strict, let me know. So Thank Michael, you. please enlighten us. I believe it can, but I would have to check. Um, I can come back with that. So uh, I don't think that some councillors can make a decision without that. So I have an answer from the manager. Well, if, if you could allow me to speak, so Deputy Mayor. Because I asked that specific question when my question was, can we look at a site-specific site exemption variance for allowing so much room for the drive-through? And he's, he indicated that there's some work to be done in this that can be looked at when we open up our new zoning and development bylaw and stuff, but we wouldn't be able to put in, if, if it's a C2 zone, it's a C2 zone. That's my concern, is the minute we ap approve a change of, variant, a change of land use to the C2 zone, the way our zoning and development bylaws are written right now, would give free reign for that. that would, they wouldn't be able to say no more because then we've already changed the land use but if we give a site specific exemption and say you can use this land and and maybe our legal can clarify that my understanding of the email but this land will be permitted to for the dual lane for the drive-through that would be more appropriate than changing our full land use at this time okay uh, again deputy can we just go through michael mr fraser uh, that's my understanding as well that it is, is that understand. Is, yeah. okay so, okay, Councilor Bernard, and then Councilor Twill. And, and that's a good point. I mean, if that works, great, because the, the, the other concern is uh, the amount of traffic that's out on the, the bypass highway when they're lining up. So, okay. Thank you. Councilor Twill, second time. Go ahead. So it's quite evident here tonight, uh, both the chair and member of the committee have made it quite clear that there's truck traffic yeah. on Angus Drive. So... A commitment that there wouldn't be truck traffic in Angus Drive was fulfilled. So in terms of truck traffic now on Angus Drive, what is the recourse for the residents? What, what do they do now when they were promised that there wouldn't be any truck traffic on Angus Drive? So what, what recourse do they have? So is it just, you know, do they have to just uh, deal with it now, live with it after council... Um, Again, I reiterate, it was an 8-1 vote to reject it, overturned by a 6-3 vote, and it was a lot of compelling testimony here that night that there's going to be no truck traffic, but we hear tonight that there is truck traffic. So what is the recourse for the residents, and who's going to hold, um, like, what, what are we going to do to eliminate that truck traffic? We've got a major concern here, and as I said earlier, earlier it has changed the fabric and the dynamic of that neighborhood a once very peaceful uh, neighborhood. Uh, street, neighborhood street, with absolutely no traffic whatsoever. So, deputy, what, 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 what's the plan of action? Should take it back to the committee. Thank you for your question, Councillor Tweel. It, um, it's a good question. It doesn't really um, deal with the resolution that's on the floor presently. Mm -hmm. However, it is a question that. Could, should be answered. 
Um, I don't know in what stage this evening we can answer that or if we have to first deal with this resolution. Um, and I'm hearing you folks, is this something we want to defer? No. Um, does somebody want to, I don't know. I mean, are we just going to leave just the resolution? Vote up, vote down, vote okay. up, vote down. Okay. Okay. Question? Questions count. Okay. All those in favor of. Well, hold on. What, what, what are we, what, are we voting on? We're, we're voting, Councillor Beck. Vote? We're voting on whether or not to go to a public consultation. Okay. Okay, so the, the, uh, there is no motion for deferral. The motion is to go to a public consultation, and the question's been called, so we're going to vote on it. Okay, all those in favor of going to the public consultation, please put up your hand. One, two, three. Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yay. Okay, all those against? Okay, Councillors Tweel, McCabe, Duran, McKinnon, Matard, and the deputy. Again, 6 4, doesn't carry. Okay, next. No, this is not a rezoning. This, this was just to go to public consultation. I, if it went to the public consultation and came back for a rezone and we turned it down, that would be one year. What would, what's, what's, Michael, could you, again, going through the deputy, if, if this turns, it, if we turn it down, it's 6-4. So we have to, yeah, so we have to vote again to reject it for a public consultation. Does it, does it defer it for a year, Michael? I'm not aware of that specific, I, I'm not unsure of that answer. I could look in the bylaw and get that answer, but I'm unsure. Yeah. Can you find out by tomorrow? Yeah, I could. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so so we have another resolution to read because we rejected a public planning resolution, so we have to go to the rejection of it. So this resolution, Your Worship, uh, do you want to still move by Deputy Mayor Alana and we don't have a mover and seconder uh, for this one? You have to get the, the Deputy and uh, Councilor McCabe. Councillor, you can second this. Thank you. So, Your Worship, uh, the uh, resolution now reads: uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Councillor Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe. Be it resolved that the request to amend Appendix A future land use map of the City of Charlottetown from low density residential to commercial and amend Appendix G zoning map of the City of Charlottetown zoning and development bylaw from low density residential zone R2 to highway commercial zone C2 for the portion of the property located at 421 St. Peter's Road PID number 464586 be rejected for public consultation. Again, this is to reject the consultation. All those in favor of the rejection, please put up your hand. In in favor of the rejection? We're rejecting it. Yay. Okay. Okay. And those against? Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Um, I vote against that okay. motion. 6 4. Yes, Your Worship. Moved by Deputy Mayor Lana Yankoff, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe. Be it resolved that the request to proceed to public consultation to amend the current development concept plan and development agreement for the property to develop a new medical treatment and mental health faci facility located at 115 Murchison Lane, PID numbers 425892 and 691162 be approved. Public. Okay, Councillor Ramsey, did you want to go? And then Councillor Tweel? Yes, okay. thank you for this, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Yanka. Was this not approved seven years ago? Were they supposed to have shovels in the ground seven years ago and then all of a sudden it's come back to us? Or am I just sort of dreaming that? Do you want to speak to that, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Yanka? Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Um, they, uh, the applicant has made changes to their original um, concept, so therefore 
it has to go through the process again because of the changes. And you'll see in your package um, some of the changes were, for example, um, creating more of a, um, a view for the patients with a water view. And there's a few other things in there that you'll, and they've shown the comparisons of the two, but that's, that's the process. It has to go back. Okay. Yep. That's Twill. Uh, to go through the public consultation process. Uh, I think when we uh, had that public meeting at the Rod Royal Inn, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, goodwill when that presentation was made to City Council by the, by the consultants. I hope that this, this particular version is not a watered down version, that it's even more contemporary than the last one, and that all the amenities there so that uh, people that, that require this help, uh, it is truly a facility that uh, walks them through the different phases and different stages and help them on the path to recovery and hopefully back into, uh, back into the community, integrated into the community with all of the, um, all of the indispensable prerequ prerequisites to help them. So this is the type of treatment that the community is looking for. This is the type of medical services, people that are truly qualified and have the credentials and a proven track record. This is what the community has been looking for. And it's about time the province uh, steps up to the plate after uh, a three-year hiatus. So I'm going to be pushing hard for this facility to be constructed. It's long overdue. Thank you. Councillor Bernard. Thank you, Arisa. Uh, the rest of my understanding is that the, this is in a CDA zone. Changes are minor. Any changes in a CDA zone has to come back to council. That's why it's here. It's just a minor. No, it's a, actually it's the it's the parking lot that's going from the north to the south side. Yeah. So we're back to another public meeting. So exactly. hopefully this will be the end of it because I think the estimated cost for this new facility is about 115 million dollars. Okay. Uh, did we pass it? All those in favor? Councilor Beck, yay or nay? In favor. Thank you. Is that it, Deputy? Is there an, oh, there's some. Okay, just one sec. Yep. Go ahead there. Your Worship, we have uh, a reading of the Zoning and Development Bylaw PHZD.2 uh, to adopt bylaw PHZD2073, a bylaw to amend the Zoning and Development Bylaw to amend Appendix G, Zoning Map of the Zoning and Dense. Zoning and Development Bylaw for Lot 39, Oak Drive, PID number 392936, Single Detached Residential R1L, Zone to Low Density Residential R2 Zone to Construct a Duplex. Okay, shall I carry? Okay, 10 0. Be it resolved that the bylaw to amend the City of Charlottetown Zoning and Development Bylaw, PHZD.2073, as it pertains to Lot 39, Oak Drive, PID number 392936, as attached, be read a first time and approved, and that it be read a second time at the next public meeting of Council. Shall I carry? Pass. Pass. Okay. Is that the only one? Yep. Did you want to say? Deputy? Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to circle back. Councillor Tweel had a question around when, when there's a development agreement in place and a part of the development agreement has not been adhered to. Um, with, if it's okay with you, Councillor Tweel, I'm going to take that back to our next our, our meeting and get a report for you and bring it back to our next council meeting so you can get a concise answer. I, I want to thank you. Thank okay. you for that commitment. And I think it's important that we be able to uh, demonstrate that to the uh, residents in Angus Drive. I mean, you know, uh, they went through three different exercises, uh, you know, and then finally it was approved. I mean, they went through a lot of torment and torture. So uh, I think I think uh, we be, we have to demonstrate to the residents that, you know, issues of this magnitude are truly being rectified. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Twill. Okay, Councilor Twill, it's your report: parks, recreation, leisure activities. And Frank's here. Thanks, Michael. Great job there, buddy. Thank you. Uh, the report is in your package. Sorry. You're on. No. Okay, the report is in your package. Um, 
we uh you got a slideshow? You got a slideshow? Yes. Okay. I want to update uh, members of city council and, and the folks that are, that are at home. I want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, give an update. Uh, Simmons Sports Center replacement project. I want to provide council and the public an update on the Simmons Sports Center replacement. Uh, the project is progressing well, is on schedule. Mayor and council can view. And it's now on your website or on your uh, screen. Uh, the public can view an overview of the project, updated renderings, images, project status, and timelines update via the city's website, www.charlottetown.ca. And once you're on the website, just click the Recreation and Leisure section and then go to the facilities and click the Simmons Sports Center Replacement Project. Easier getting a hold of the CIA. Can but you go over that again? Less, Can you uh, repeat that again? Uh, pardon me? Can you repeat that again? I didn't get it all. I'm just writing it down. Oh, no, I'll get it after. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're always down in the manager's office every day. He can give you an update. <laughs> right, Frank? Okay, so as you can see, Sample renderings images show a state-of-the-art, I'll emphasize, a state-of-the-art multi-purpose and recreation facility. This is a, this is a fantastic project. It's, it's a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, replacement for uh, the old Simmons Sports Center, you know, which, which is on its last legs. I'm surprised it lasted this long. This is, this is a great facility with, with uh, some great attributes and, and, and amenities that the people are going to be really pleased with. Uh, one of the things we talked about at our Parks and Recreation Committee meeting was the, uh, the walking track, which is going to be on the second floor. It won't have to compete. There'll be no conflicts with uh, our uh, user groups that are accessing the ice, going back and forth to the dressing rooms. I mean, it's, uh, if you look now at the swimming pool, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful swimming pool. Uh, 25, uh, 25 meters, six, six lanes, and heat it. So, uh, you know, things are progressing well. And to my mind, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a benchmark for the replacement for the Cody Banks Arena. Uh, we're going to start uh, planning for the Cody Banks Arena. And, and, uh, but this, this facility here, to my mind, is the benchmark. It really is. And I know our senior citizens in particular are going to be uh, very pleased with uh, the walking track. Uh, and of course, the ones that skate, a lot of them skate, but, but the walking track is going to be just, just a, uh, a tremendous uh, addition to the new facility uh, and we'll be able to use it year round and uh, we're all looking forward to it. If there's any questions, I'll do my best. Of course, Frank is here as well to Alex, answer from a technical perspective. Thank you. You'll be taking the first dive in the pool? Right is that away. what I heard? You'll be taking the first dive in the Dad, pool? you're coming with me. And guess who's coming up and guess who's not? <laughs> Is that a threat? <laughs> Any questions about it? And again, charlottetown.ca, go to the website, Parks Recreation. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you, go ahead. As you can see, with the renderings, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great facility. It really is uh, great renderings and state of the art. And I think all members of council are going to be very, very pleased uh, when this uh, facility opens up next, next October. Yeah. Councilor Twill, are you also planning a, I think, working with Jackie McKinnon to work to do a tour with some of the councillors or the councillors that want to go? Good. If the council's interested in tour, please, uh, 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 Jackie, know him, and Jackie will talk to Frank, and then we'll go from there. Okay. We'd be glad to do that. Frank, did you want to mention something? I'll just make a comment. We do have the actual site tour lined up. I just got it confirmed today, so I'll be sending out a meeting notice to all the elected officials <coughs> with regards to that date and time. And you'll be working through a comms department, too. Thank you. Yes, okay. you're correct. Any? Councilor Ramsey? Thank you, Your Worship. You stole my, my thunder there, my, my question about the tour. Um, and this is a facility. It's gonna, we're going to try and keep, operate 20 uh, year round, right? 12 months of the year, like pickleball and everything else in the summer and things along that line. I'm hoping. That's okay. No, it's a good question. Good question. Um, as you know, with the, the older facility, 
we weren't able to operate year round because of the floor. Um, this facility here will be totally dedicated to sports and recreation and will be going year round. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of different sports. I mean, uh, back in the days of the old Simmons, there was box lacrosse. Uh, I played box lacrosse, and, and uh, you know it was it was a great uh, great sport to be involved with. And I'm I'm hoping that there's going to be a strong resurgence of uh, box lacrosse, and and that's just one example. But this facility will be going uh, year round. Thank you, sir. Okay, a couple of resolutions there, Council Twill. Deputy Mayor Yankov. Thank you. And just in terms of the the report that was in our package from Parks and Recreation and Leisure, I also listened to the meeting, and I just wanted to thank Councillor Twill for bringing up the um, the option to keep the um, the lane open at Victoria Park um, all year round. And I know that um, I listened and I heard that Manager um, Frank Quinn said that the, you know there's a process, there's a Victoria Park bylaw, and there's a, there's lots of um, hopes and things to um, have to go through. The only question I had is, how come we were able to do it during COVID? So if we were able to do it during COVID, what, why, why couldn't we do it now? I'm just a bit perplexed. Thank you. Councilor Twill. Thank you. A very good question. Very good question. Um, I, too, am a very strong proponent. I know that uh, Councilor Beck is as well. Uh, a lot of residents uh, that would like that uh, that lane to be uh, used for uh, cycling and I mean I, I'm still watching people walk there now they think it's it's still uh, an act for all intents and purposes they still believe it's an act of transportation pathway as opposed to vehicle traffic that kind of scares me uh, so um, Frank uh, I think our deputy mayor asked a very good question if we were able to do it during COVID, uh, why can't we do it now? And what can we do to expedite the process? I, I believe there's a strong, strong appetite amongst members of council and certainly amongst the uh, the public. Councilor Twill, do you want to go through the manager, uh, Frank? Sure, Your Worship, and uh, Councilor Twill and, and Deputy Mayor. Uh, so there is a process. We, we did it there. We actually extended it on one end and the other. So I think we actually... Uh, opened it earlier uh, due to uh, COVID and we actually changed and it was a resolution to council <clears throat> and we actually changed the use from actually just a cycling lane to an active transportation lane which could be used by everybody. Uh, so if we were wanting to make it year round, that's more permanent. So what we'll be doing is bringing that back to council. Council will decide if we want to go that direction. We would have to have public consultation and go through that. It's not saying it can't happen. Uh, it's it's kind of the council's decision. But we'd bring that back through our process. There'd be a resolution come, and then we'd go to uh, uh, as court according to the Victoria Park bylaw. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you for that, um, um, Mr. Quinn, and to our to the chair of the committee. Then could I ask then that could be put on your next agenda yeah. to start the process? glad to um, and see what we can do to, uh, to expedite again to expedite that process uh, again I, I think it's a good good recommendation a good decision and and I know there's a lot of appetite in the community okay thank particularly you. young families that would welcome that opportunity yeah. okay thank you, you Councilor Tweed <coughs> do you have a resolution there Sue Yes, Your Worship. We have a resolution moved by Councillor Mitchell Tweel, seconded by Councillor Terry Bernard, that as per the recently advertised request for proposals 2023 Parks Playground Equipment, the City of Charlottetown accepts the low bid from JIL Engineering and Construction in the amount of $48,018 plus applicable taxes for the purchase of a medium-sized play structure for Evergreen Park, and that the estimate additional amount, estimated additional amount of 20,000 to be approved for the playground structure, installation and contingency costs. And further that the mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Okay. Councilor Twill, you want to speak to your resolution? Yes, I just want to pay tribute to the councilor for the ward. I know he was, uh, was asking about uh, the playground and, and, and he was uh, he was lobbying hard, and I just wanted to let you know that the fruits of your labor 
has now become a, come, become a reality, and I know your constituents are going to be very pleased uh, with this new, uh, new playground structure. Congratulations. You can never say no to playgrounds. Okay. Qu questions call. All those in favor should be 10 0. Councillor Beck. I'll make it 10. And he makes it 10. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Tweel. Next uh, is water and wastewater. Councillor Bob Duran. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, her water and sewer utility committee met on October 12th um, and we meet again on uh, Monday uh, the 20th. I do not have any resolutions for your consideration here tonight but if anybody wants to ask me any questions on the minutes or anything about water and sewer I'll try to answer them as best I can. Thank you. Councillor Tweel. No, excuse me, Deputy Mary Ankop and then Councillor Tweel. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Duran, for your report. I'm not sure if this question um, would be for your department or if it would be for Public Works or it could be a combination of the two. There's been some ongoing communication um, with the corner of 105 Kent Street around um, some damage that had um, um, occurred during the digging up of putting the fiber op under the ground and such that's left some of the business owners with um, water, um, the, the sidewalks are, are going in towards their buildings, there's doors that aren't working anymore, and there's been some, there's been some information back and forth, but it seems to have stalled, and I'm just wondering, can this be brought to, back to your committee, can it be brought, just to, just to find some resolution around the struggles that the, um, the area in question is having, and if this is for public works, I apologize. Councillor Duran, I think it's the fiber up yes. project. It's probably, yes, I think that's not up. Yep. Yeah, it would be over the fiber optic digging, I would assume. Uh, we'll put it on the agenda for Monday. Uh, that way, our manager can uh, discuss it with the public works to see what can be done, um, and then he'll have an answer for us on Monday, and, and we'll get back to you with that answer. That's and, okay. And also, Councillor Drawn, with the installer of the fiber op, too, right? He'll be speaking to him also? Is yes. That, yeah, yeah, we'll get all that get all right that, into yeah. the uh, meeting that's, there on Monday. If you're able to attend, you I'll can, be there. You can ask that question. I will. We'll, we'll be more prepared for that question on Monday. Under thank business you. arising. Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Twill, you had a question about yeah. water and wastewater? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Drawn. Last month, as you know, I asked a question about the fiber optics and, and uh, the work that was being uh, completed here in the city of Charlottetown, and I asked about the uh, contract, and I think you said that uh, the Water and Sewer Committee was going to be discussing the contract at a follow-up meeting a couple of days after the council meeting. I'm just looking for a status report. If uh, lawyers have completed their, their work and if the contract... Uh, has been signed. Yes, Ron. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, that is on our agenda. Uh, for we actually were supposed to meet last week. We would have had the questions prepared for you, but there was a little glitch there, uh, and we had to postpone our meeting until Monday. So, you know, my apologies of not get, not getting back to you. Uh, we didn't discuss it, but like I said. Um, the manager is well aware of, of where we're going and will certainly answer your question and we'll get back to you Monday. Like I said, we'll, you know, my apologies for not getting back to you uh, as quickly as we could, but we'll discuss it Monday and get back to you then. Okay. Thank you. See you on Monday, Councillor. Well, see you on Monday. You yeah. Uh, Councillor McCabe, <laughs> Public Works, I want to wait to see the contract. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, our Public Works Committee did not meet since the last council meeting. There were conferences for staff, some vacations, and also some sickness. We will be meeting on November 22nd, so I would suspect to be prepared for a long meeting. 
I did ask for some updates to be able to share. Uh, staff have shifted into overdrive today, starting to decorate the city now for the holiday season. I know there's been correspondence around Christmas decorations and parity among the city to try to make sure that everybody's um, going to have a little bit of something. Also, uh, I think our manager provided a good explanation of why maybe certain areas aren't being decorated as much as other areas based on regulations, but we're always looking at how we can improve that. So they're going to be out full force setting up displays, installing lighting, decorating trees, um, with priority right now in the downtown area to be ready for the Charlottetown Christmas Festival, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. That kicks off on November 24th with our big tree lighting ceremony. I won't rain on someone else's parade. New uh, staff have now moved into our new public works building, so that's exciting to see that that's finally come to light, and I'm sure there's lots of happy people in their nice new clean space, so it's exciting. Staff continue to complete scheduled work, which includes sidewalk replacements, patching, which is hoped uh, to be wrapped up by next week, where they'll kick into the winter operations. Um, hopefully they won't have a busy winter. I'm not going anywhere. On the capital side, uh, the phase one of the Eastern Gateway project is hoping to get started at the end of the month. Contractor focusing on replacing the water line. This is necessary as, the work, um, as this work will extend Riverside Drive, which is in the limits of the work for the province's next year road. Uh, thank you to Albert and Scott and uh, the chief engineers of the province, as well as Stephen Yeo and his team. They had an open house at the library last week, which was well attended. Um, some really good questions, lots of great discussion. I think there's going to be some ongoing discussion with our business partners in downtown Charlottetown Inc., uh, the Port Authority. You know, they have concerns, fair enough. And I think we always have to collaborate to make sure that we're addressing and dealing with the concerns as they come forward. And we all know that when we communicate well, it certainly reduces the um, anxiety in our city. So so thank you to Scott for, for taking the lead on that. So other than that, um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. If you have any questions, we'll do our best to answer. Scott's here as well. Thank you. Always questions. Councilor Tart. Can I say something? Thank Can you, uh, Councilor yeah. Kay, for that uh, great update. Just one second. Sorry. Councilor Beck, I'll come to you yeah, after. I, just, yeah. I know you're on the, okay. in, in the queue, yeah. so I'll come to you at the end. Okay, okay. thanks. Councilor right. thank, uh, thank you, Councilor McKay, for that great update. Uh, I just want to bring awareness, uh, public safety awareness, to uh, the Belvedere roundabout. There is a medium, I guess, that is uh, facing in front of uh, Gordon Drive and comes into the parking lot. And in a very short period of time, that pole, the light pole there the for the crosswalk has been struck at least twice now, I think. So, um, and it is uh, it is causing some concern. I, I believe myself, I come in and edit that area quite often. And I, I think there's a blind spot there that you just, we're just not seeing that little medium in the, in the middle of the road. So, um, so just revisiting that to determine if that's the best approach, is an overhang light better in the sense of impeding traffic there? Because there's certainly a reason why people are missing that uh, particular medium. I don't know, paint it completely yellow or something to make it stand out. Clearly the manager is aware of that, but I just wanted to bring it forward to, to draw some attention to that particular area. There was an, an incident back in the summer, I believe, in that general area. It was a fairly serious incident in around there. So a lot of traffic going in different directions. It's been a huge improvement since the roundabout has been there. Can't say enough about it, but that one particular spot, I think, is just causing some grief now in that area. So um, through to the manager, if, if you'd like to comment on that. Thank you. Um, do you wish to, Councilor McCabe, do you want to go there? Well, this would definitely be more operational, and I think information for Scott to be aware of around safety concerns. Well, I don't have anything to add, but Scott, maybe you could <coughs> say something. Uh, your Worship. Uh, through to Council Matard. Um, so yes, we're aware of the issue. Uh, it has been hit a number of times uh, this year. Uh, so it is something we have started investigating, are going to look into it and see what we can do to augment it to make it more visible. Uh, the challenge is that is a well-utilized crosswalk and so what's installed there is to protect the pedestrians. Um, and, and so the poll is kind of doing that, um, but uh, no, it is something. So if there's, we're going to look at a few options, whether it's uh, we're, making the poll more reflective, things like that, we'll look at options to make that improvement. Yeah. Cal Councillor Twill. Councillor Twill. Red light. Thank you. I want to take this opportunity to uh, 
I thank the Public Works Committee and all members of council for supporting, um, unanimously supporting the active transportation pathway on Towers Road. The uh, project is now completed. It's a, it's a nice pathway. It's good and wide, approximately <coughs> eight feet in width. And it's now safe for the residents and the people in that community that commute up and down Towers Road to go to the mall, to access the rails and trails, especially for the students uh, that attend UPEI. So again, I want to thank all members of council. Uh, the feedback has been tremendous from the people that live in that community. They're very, very happy. And this was a project that's been on the books for the last three to four years. It's now completed. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Twilley. Councilor Twilley, you want to turn off your phone? It keeps going. Your phones keep keeps going. The system has detected uh, that a few Councilor lines McKinnon, are still connected to the conference and will attempt to disconnect them. If you wish to remain in the conference, please press 1. To dial out, please dial the area code and number that you wish to connect to the conference, followed by the pound sign. Press star to return to the conference. Press star, Councilor Beck. Okay. Councilor McKinnon, and then Councilor Beck. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, uh, Councilor McCabe, for your report. I just have a question. Um, Manager of Public Works had announced uh, a few weeks ago there's going to be a new four-way stop being put up at the intersection of Paddington Road and Royalty Road. Residents are asking, can they have some of the flashing stop signs there? Um, instead of just the normal ones, because there is reduced visibility coming out of um, Upton onto Royalty Road. So if there is some flashing signs put over on Sleepy Hollow Road, so if that can be addressed. Yes. Yes. I don't know where he announced it. Obviously, you guys had good conversation. Again, I would consider this an operational issue when they determine the city engineers determine where we need to have stop signs and uh, as a safety measure and as far as flashing lights I, I don't know how many of those we have but I'm sure they have their reasons for why they put in uh, Scott I know I'm duly noted there chief engineer do you want to respond and your worship through to Councilor McKinnon um, we can definitely look at if they're warranted um, we try to follow the warrants as closely as possible. Of course, there's always judgment calls that you can make. Uh, but we want to keep consistency across the city um, and follow like other jurisdictions do. Just it, it's a it's to ensure that when people drive to a certain intersection, they expect a certain, um, uh, have a certain expectation of what they're going to see. Um, and it also is part of just uh, being mindful of liability uh, for the city. So definitely something we'll look at if it does warrant it. Um, we will look at... Uh, um, likely wouldn't be the stop sign that you saw in Sleepy Hollow. They are non-conforming use in Canada at this moment. That uh, I haven't seen anything that says that they are conforming use. Um, our standard is the flashing red ball above the stop sign. Um, they work very, very well. Um, you see them around right now, Maple and uh, Oak over by the, uh, the school. Uh, very effective, um, and, and so that would be something that we would look at uh, if they weren't it. So we'll, keep that under, we'll take that under advisement um, and... Um, uh, as we go to install that, look to see if it warrants it. Thank you there, uh, Chief Engineer. Deputy. <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor McCabe, for your report. I'm just curious, back in June, I believe, um, we were asking about the paving report on the worst first, and I believe Mr. Adams told us at that time that it was coming. And I'm just wondering, like, is there any update on that? Is it coming? Thanks. Do you wish to answer that, Councilman McCabe? Sure. Thank you. Thank well, you, Your Worship, and thank you, Deputy Mayor. And what I can tell you is I know, um, from what I understand, that will be something that's coming forward with the active transportation sidewalk plan. Um, a lot of this stuff's coming in as we're getting ready to go into budget, for sure. I think there was some work to be done with water and sewer, too, as they did with the Passmore Street project and stuff. They're looking at really where and what areas are going to be kind of collective to make sure it makes sense when they're doing these bigger projects with streets. Embrace yourself. We're going to make street paving a, hopefully a priority, so we stay ahead of this, so we'll be coming looking for, uh, for good money. But that list, uh, Scott, again, that should be coming to committee. Will it be at our committee next week? Next month? 
the next month. Yeah. Okay, so we need, I think people went, and I think we were going to look at how we were going to assess that worst first too, and I think Correct. we need to be able to update council on the process for that. Correct. So those will be things that are still coming. We haven't mm -hmm. had them at committee level yet. You can't be paving. Okay, Councillor Beck. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, sir. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you for your yeah, thank you for your report there, Councillor McCabe. Um, I just wanted to add my two cents on the North River Road study that was conducted recently and the public uh, consultation that took place and went with it. Unfortunately, I was in the province at the time and I didn't get to attend the uh, public meeting, but I did have the opportunity to sit down with uh, Riley Tweel prior to and, and get a good insight. And uh, I, I have to admit that I was uh, very impressed with the work that uh, went into it. Um, a lot of good good thought, good options, um, considerations for the residents to look at. And um, I know that we are bound by the uh, tightness of North River Road, and that is always a concern that is on the residents' mind, and uh, certainly right down to Brighton Road. And, uh, you know, I've heard from residents in my ward as well, too. And uh, I'm glad that we're um, the uh, public work staff has been, done such a great job of pull, pulling the information together and really looking at a lot of options. And um, so kudos to the staff for doing that and uh, conducting it, and the feedback that I received from those who were in attendance were that it uh, went over very well, and uh, we look forward to the next phase of where things go from here, but uh, good first steps along that process for sure. So thank you for that. Well done there, Councillor Beck. Thank you very much. Okay. Economic, tourism, cultural development. Councillor Trevor McKinnon, Ward 8. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Economic Tourism and Cultural Development Committee and Arts Committee Board did not meet since last uh, meeting of council. Uh, there's no resolutions for cons consideration and I have a few departmental uh, highlights to address. I'd like to echo your comments that you made earlier, Your Worship, on the World U-17 Hockey Challenge with a big shout out and sincere thank you to the organizing committee the many volunteers and the financial partners and fans who helped make the hockey tournament uh, a huge success. Uh, Tis the season for the Charlottetown Christmas Festival. Begins November 24th, runs through January 2nd. Uh, check out the three signature events. On the opening weekend is the Victorian Christmas Market, Charlottetown Christmas Tree Lighting, and the Charlottetown Christmas Parade. Uh, staff recently participated in two growth and attraction missions, Spohawks 23 and Primetime Sport and Entertainment. And recently there was five awards handed out to members of the Charlottetown Creative Community during the Charlottetown Arts and Culture Awards. And congratulations to all nominees and uh, recipients. So if there's any questions, uh, the manager, Mr. Long, is here and try to, try to answer them. Deputy? Thank you, Councillor McKinnon, for your report. Um, just to echo what a few others have talked about, specifically the mayor in the beginning when we saw the, the final 30 seconds of that um, under-17 hockey game. I'm just wondering if, through you to your manager, um, if we could just get a little Reader's Digest version on how we were so fortunate and how, how it comes to be that we get to host such an event like that. Um, yeah, it's uh, kudos to the committee and the staff and the, and um, yeah, if they, just a little bit of background on that. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Deputy, and I will defer that uh, to Manager Mr. Long for all his hard work. Your Worship, uh, through the chair, events like this um, don't just come by accident. It takes a lot of effort and time to secure these events. We've prospected this particular event for several years uh, now, and um, the City of Charlottetown led a bid uh, and asked the City of Summerside to join us as a partner on the event, and we were fortunate enough to be the recipient of the hosting rights to this particular event, so there'll be many other communities across the country who are vying for these rights, so it's a real kudo, uh, kudo for us. Uh, it, it helps us complete our hosting basket in terms of Hockey Canada properties, 
and uh, it will only serve us well moving forward. So it is an intense bidding process, and uh, we're happy to have led and secure the rights to that event. And it was shared by two municipalities, Summerside and Charlottetown. Well done. Okay, uh, Councillor Tweel, Councillor McLaren, and Councillor Bernard. Last month, I, I brought up the issue of the uh, carbon tax on heating oil and on, on gasoline, diesel fuel. Uh, I think the feds, according to Iraq, have removed uh, the carbon tax on heating oil. I, I would like to challenge the provincial government as well to remove the carbon tax on heating oil and also on, on gasoline as well. I think both uh, levels of government are starting to realize that these are very difficult times for people uh, trying to raise their families, uh, commuting back and forth to work, trying to make ends meet. These are very difficult economic <clears throat> times. And as I said last month, in terms of trying to raise our, rate, uh, reach our goals in terms of eliminating gas emissions, there's got to be other creative and innovative ways. We're doing some good things here at City Hall, like the switch program and other incentives. So uh, I don't think we need to punish the, uh, the rate payers, the taxpayers. And again, I want to reiterate, I would like to uh, challenge the provincial government to eliminate uh, the carbon tax on heating oil and, and gasoline as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's just too difficult now, and uh, it's the right thing to do to eliminate the taxes on on all of those all of those uh, necessities. Thank Council, you. Thank you, Councilor McAleer, Councilor Bernard. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brown. Just uh, just like to make a uh, comment, um, uh, Wayne and uh, your team, in getting that uh, the, the uh, under seventeen uh, hockey. Uh, uh, event, uh, you know, at that arena. It just, um, I know when sitting on uh, economic development uh, and uh, budgeting and uh, that uh, East, East Link facility is, um, you know, going forward in the absence of uh, not being able to uh, get a 110 or 20 or 30 million dollar sport and entertainment center, I think our East Link center to, uh, to be relevant going forward, um, I know being around uh, a couple of games and talking to some of the you know, personnel like uh, John Abbott and shared with you, like when um, when uh, to host these events, uh, you have to have your facility, uh, you know, to a certain standard. And, uh, you know, John shared with me, which I guess that wouldn't be surprised to anybody, like, you know, Hockey Canada, um, we signed a, you know, there's uh, quite a contract you have to sign to, to host that facility, but they come in and they look at your physical plant and, and you know, dressing rooms and, uh, you know, and these things. So. Um, you know that uh, you know that arena is getting that arena is getting tired, and I think uh, you know we're going to have to be as a city and a council probably have to be a bit of a catalyst to um, talk to our partners, the province and the feds, to see if we uh, you know can't um, can't make a pitch to uh, to uh, you know uh, continue to invest in what we have there as an East Link Center to be relevant in this sort of. Uh, events and activities that we like to, you know, continue to host at that facility, be it be them concerts or whatever. So it's, I know last year uh, they came and they were looking for two million dollars to upgrade, and it was perhaps looked at as a dressing room, but it's bigger than that. Um, you know, when people come in, even for these concerts and things, it's. Uh, so anyway, um, it's just you know, it's, you know, it's just a comment. I don't think we can uh, defer on it uh, much longer. I, I know. Uh, I certainly try, I'm going to continue to uh, to speak on it, you know, in our Committee of Economic Development. I think it's a conversation that we should be should be initiating and continue to talk about because that facility does, uh, you have to keep it to a certain standard if you're going to be in a, as they call it, I guess, maybe, uh, maybe we can't be in the A market, but uh, if you're going to be in the B market, you still have to have a certain standard and, and uh, so that uh, just, uh, I think we have to be wise to that going forward and uh, Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McLear. Councilor Bernard. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just wanted to talk about the under-17 worlds, too, and just say, you know, great things happen with partnerships. It was a great partnership with the City of Summerside, Your Worship. Uh, great job with the staff of, to, to land something like the under-17 worlds. Um, even nicer to see 
Team Canada White win the gold medal uh, in the city of Charlottetown. So good job. Kudos to the staff. I think Team White with Summerside. Pardon me? Team White with Summerside, were they not? Uh, but they won the gold in Charlottetown. <laughs> All around. It, it was, was it was super. Is that it, Councillor McKinnon? Okay. Uh, Councillor Bernard, you're next. Environment and sustainability. Thanks again, Wayne and Laurel and the group. Group. Uh, On uh, October the 30th, there is two resolutions for council consideration. Um, just some information though, I'd like to let everybody know that the tree planting for 2023 is complete with the support of many volunteers, partners and staff in public works and parks and recreation. Over 2,600 trees and shrubs were planted. Plantings took place in the city parks, natural areas, uh, city right of ways, private residence property and along active transportation pathways. So some of the highlights were to include 175 trees run residential property as part of the Operation Relief. Uh, the city's first mini forest, which we received national recognition. Uh, we worked with uh, 150 high school students from Charlottetown Rural High School to restore Hermitage Creek, Creek. And we worked with UPI to restore Evergreen Park and planting of 180 trees in the Acadian Forest. So you worship, but I probably should note uh, tomorrow's the last day, I guess. So the city is currently accepting applications for the Charlottetown Food Council. Uh, members of council uh, will work with the city to improve the food system. Um, focusing on, on intersection of the food system and climate action. So the application will be accepted until November 15th, so tomorrow at 4 o'clock, your worship. So um, for anyone that's interested, it, they, it's more information on charlottetown.ca slash food council. And I believe Katrina did, a, did an interview on that on CBC Radio. So she did a great job. So, Worship, like I say, there's two resolutions, and if there's any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Councilor Bernard, uh, what were the number of trees that we planted in Victoria Park? Was it up to 350, 400? Do we know? I was out there for... How many trees were planted at Victoria Park? Yeah. Yeah, it was around the 300, 350. Which was uh, almost double what was taken down. Great, great. Yeah. Councilor Drawn? Well, actually, you know, the, the, for, for 2,600 in one year, trees and shrubs. Yeah. Excellent. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Councilor Drawn. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Thank you, uh, Councilor Bernard, for your report. Uh, I'm just going over the minutes, and I remember asking at the last meeting, um, about the stump program. I know it's been uh, a lot of people uh, have been l looking for it and, and asking about it. Um, I'm just wondering where we're at with the, with the number. I know we put 200,000 in our budget for it. Is, is that being depleted? Um, you know, I'm, I'm back again asking for an appetite of, I know we voted on it, about uh, if people meet the criteria could they apply uh, even though, you know, we started this in uh, the summer or the September? So I'm just kind of looking at or trying to gauge a, uh, a number. Is, our, is our, our budget going down fairly quickly or is the possibility to reach out uh, to the people that met the criteria but were not allowed to apply due to the fact that we, we never started the program? So. I don't know if you have the number. I, I, I don't know if, if it's fair to ask Jessica if she has the number. No. Maybe we can bring it back to the committee. Councilor Bernard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and thanks to Councilor Duran. I, I don't have a number. Uh, we can certainly find that it and bring it back. But I, I think uh, my understanding is that the question was asked here, and Council voted 7 to 2 to stay the course the way it is. So it, regardless of how much money is in that account, how much of it's burnt up, I don't think we're going to be going back and, and going back in time. Uh, I, I believe when the program was launched, the people that were eligible at that point is the ones that were going to be eligible to get a rebate if, if they had the receipts and they, had, and they had it signed off by the by the contractors. Thank you. Councilor Durant. Thank you for the second opportunity. I understand that. We, we voted. We went with staff's recommendation. But, you know, uh, a lot of times there that we, we put uh, some money out and council's not fully informed of, of what could happen. You know, if, if all of a sudden the money is gone right away, um, the 200000 then I, I could say, okay, that, that's fine. Uh, there was a desire there for the residents to, to access this program. But I'm, what I'm asking now is, is for council's consideration, maybe, 
if there is money, it, it hasn't been depleted so quickly, uh, then those people that met the criteria, um, would they be allowed to submit their paperwork? And I think a couple of people did. I'm not, I'm not saying there's 100 people. I'm just saying that there's some people that met the criteria, but the deadline was implemented uh, probably in September, and they had um, had stumps removed in June or 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 uh, let's say April or May or June. So, you know, that would my request to council and the committee and and to the to the chair and manager would be to, if the money's not being depleted very quickly then we could help those people that meet the criteria. So I understand where you are and we voted on it, but at the time I don't think council was fully aware that, you know, okay, we're starting this program and there was a couple of people that applied that met the criteria, but we decided we, we wouldn't allow them. So if it's not depleted, maybe there's something we could look at. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. Task Bernard, good. You wanna just follow uh, up? Yeah, I, I mean, you could, you could always look at programs. I, I think, you know, some of the comparisons I like to use for this, and there's reasons why staff recommend it twice now to, to uh, hold the process to where it is. Um, I, I guess an example I, I may give is, you know, the, the province used to offer uh, heat pumps, $40,000 household income or less to get a free heat pump. Uh, that's now moved up to $75,000. Um, did they rebate the people back that were... Uh, yeah, did they rebate the people back that, that paid for theirs at 50 or 60,000? No, they didn't. It's because that's where the program started. That was the new program. Um, so just, you know, I, I know it's not a, a great comparison, Councilor John, but that some of the reasons is how do you confirm if it's already been done months ago and, and how far back do you go? But I will, I will get the number for you how much has been spent so far. Okay, okay we got a couple of resolutions. Sue Fraser. From Your Worship, uh, resolution number one from Environment and Sustainability, moved by Councillor Terry Bernard, seconded by Councillor Bob Duran, that the City of Charlottetown award a contract to Dugan and Associates the highest scoring proposal for the creation of a post Fiona urban restoration strategy at a cost of $78,839 plus HST, and that the Mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Question, Councilor Matar. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councilor Beck. Uh, in favor. Yep. Next one. The next resolution, Your Worship, moved by Councilor Terry Bernard and seconded by Councilor Bob Duran, be it resolved that the City of Charlottetown endorse a two-step procurement process for the Transit Depot design build project with step one being an expression of interest with up to three candidates being selected to provide a full request for proposal, and that Mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Okay, Councilor Trant. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, we discussed this a lot at our committee level, and, and you know, I did vote to take it to council, uh, you know, to, to see if we could explain what was going on here. Um, you know, this, this type of contract, it was, it was explained in depth that we have to uh, allot 10,000 to three bidders uh, so they can uh, do their best work to get it, uh, get a design for the station. This was a, a road we were going to go down. Uh, we, we went down this road before, but I have some reservations about, you know, giving money to, to do this type of... Uh, um, project. You know, I, I think by opening up to everyone, if you're interested, I don't think 10,000 is going to make or break you to, to put in an application. Um, so when it's explained that, you know, we have to give the top three 10,000 to help with their, ex, uh, you know, their, their development on this project, I just have a, a, a large reservation of, of supporting it. So I know I supported it to go to council and I just wanted some clarification on it. Yeah. Um, so I just, you know, I, I can't support this one. Yeah. So thank you. Councilor Bernard. Thank you, Russell. I'm gonna give some information on this and, and, and uh, try to let council know why. Um, 
we did talk about this at, at council, and we had uh, Albert speaking on it also. Um, so in order to ensure high quality applicants take the needed time to create a proposal, propose, uh, proposal sub submission, um, it is common practice to post an expression of interest before the full request for proposal. This procedure was also a recommendation from our transit consultants working on this file. Um, so one thing I think that we, we need to understand is that there's timelines that must be adhered to to get the financing from the federal government. We have a lot of money on the table that we've been approved for, and the clock's ticking. Um, which I, I believe it's April 2025, I think, that, that, that the facility has to be completed. Um, it's not just a building that you build. This is an electrification building. It's going to be doing a number of uh, electric buses. There's going to be a needed of, of battery storage. So it's, it's not something that we have a lot of experience. I don't think there's a lot of people out there with the experience. Um, if we get good experience companies bidding on this, it will definitely uh, there'll be less change orders. Uh, and you're working with one company. So in, in a sense, it's a $13.5 million project, and we will save the 10000 or 20000 It's up, up to the top three bidders. We'll, we'll, we'll get the $10,000 as an expression of, of, of interest. Um, but we're looking for the high quality applicants to take the time needed to create the proposal submission. Um, and a lot of these stuff that I'm reading here was in your package, but I just want to highlight it. The recommendation for the stipend came forward at a concern that the scale of the project would teeter companies from bidding on it. A company will have to put a lot of resources into putting together a proper proposal for this large project. The stipend is awarded to the top three in recognition of the extra time and staffing that it will that we'll have to put into the proposal if we get three. Um, so will we save that money? Yeah, we will. So at the end of the day, what we're looking for is a high quality contractor who has experience in it and that we're dealing with one person and that we get the project up and running and complete it as soon as possible. So and that's, that's where, that's where uh, because we know the company has to put in a lot of resources just to, put, just to be put in their expression of interest or their bid. They have to, there's a lot of work that has to go into that, extra time, extra staff, and so on. So, um, and the last point I'll point out is with a design-build project, steps can happen simultaneously with one company completing both the design and the build. Once a company is awarded the tender, the schedule will move faster and there is less risk to finishing the project within the budgeted time frame. So there is also less chance for cost overruns because there is only one company designing and building the project. The 10,000 stipend will ensure quality proposals. The stipends will come out of the 13.5 million that's been budgeted in our capital budget for the, for the electrification of transit. So that's why we're looking to, to go this route. So, thank you. Councilman Tarrant and then Councilman Drawn. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Bernard. Um, ever since I read this one, I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit now myself. I know I voted in favor of it when we did it for the parkade over here. But what I guess I'm starting to ask myself now is, why do we feel that we can't attract quality bids? Why do we feel we have to pay for that? This is a 13 plus million dollar contract. I would only expect quality bids to a 13,000, 13 million dollar uh, bid. Um, I don't know what president we're setting here for paying people to submit for expression of interest or RFPs, and how are we determining that as we go along? Uh, as my first year in council here, I've seen many RFPs that have come in. Uh, we've seen some of major magnitude here, and those are the ones that we seem like we're struggling to be confident that we may get good quality uh, app, um, proposals. So we want to pay for that. Um, I think if somebody is bidding on a $13 million project, it will be a very good um, proposal. And that's the cost of doing business. It literally is the cost of doing business for companies who have to put time and energy in to successfully win um, a competitive process through an expression of interest, RFP, 
Um, and, and I think as I put more thought into this particular one, it seems like now this is becoming the norm. And uh, from a finance perspective, to our finance chair, I'm not sure what the thought of from a finance. So we're, we're, we're spending $30,000 to essentially get um, people interested in putting in bids. So I think if we were to put out an express of interest and we did not get any interest, there might be opportunities to entice people. That's one thing, but we're putting out the money before we even know how many bids that we have. So um, I'm, I'm struggling with, with this path we're going down in paying to have people put forward uh, proposals for large scale scope work that we have. Thank you. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, um, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of projects been done on PEI that has to do with the electrification of, of uh, a fleet of buses or the battery storage and so on. So the whole idea is, and the reason this came from the consultants recommending it, is to get high quality people to bid. The concern is that um, if there's not the enticement, the amount of time and staff resources that they have to put into their expression of interest, they may feel that it's not worth it. We don't know if, we're, if it's going to go any further or not, so the amount of money that that may cost. We're also looking at it for if we go this route and we do get the one contractor, we do get a, a, a good experienced contractor, that we will save time, we'll save money, and the, 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 the 10, 20, or 30,000 that it may cost will be recouped easily. So, and then that, I don't know, Jessica, if you may want no, to add no, something. It, can I just get Councillor Drawn? He's been waiting there in the queue. Councillor Drawn. Sure. Thank you, and, and, Brown, and, and thank you, Councillor Bernard, for your explanation. Uh, I agree 100% with you, Councillor Matart, and I appreciate your comments. This is the road that we're going to go down. You know, it's $30,000. As, as a developer, anybody, if I was looking, if I had a company and I was looking to keep my men or women working, if this was a $13 million project, whether I was based in Toronto or Newfoundland, I'd be saying, hey, let's, let's do the work that's part of business. Let's, let's apply. It's not going to take $10,000 uh, of a gift to help me out. I, I think a $13 million project would certainly get top quality developers in doing this type of project. I, I think it's a slippery slope that we're going down that we feel that we should have to give money to, to people to bid on our projects. We're, we're a quality town here. You know, we pay our bills. I think any contractor, given the, the specifications of this build, would, would jump at the chance at a $13 million bid within a year to have it completed. So. Again, thank you for your explanations, both councillors, and, 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 and I appreciate the time, but I can't support this. Thank you. Uh, just one second, uh, Deputy, and then you can, then Councillor Bernard. Uh, th yeah, thank you, Councillor Bernard, for your report, and I appreciate what I'm hearing from Councillor Duran and Councillor Matard. Um, I, I listened to the meeting and did a little um, research on this, and um, to the two um, counselors, you know, I understand the the, the concerns that you have, but um, <clears throat> you know, we're in changing times, and I'm I'm hearing in the research I've done that this seems to be a best practice going forward on how people are encouraged to um, put out healthy and um, good bids for different um, things like this. So, um, for that reason, I will support this resolution. Councilor Bernard. Thank you, Worship. Um, and I had those concerns, the same concerns as Councilor Duran and, 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 and Councilor Matarit. Um, and the same thing with the, the, the government garages. We had a lot of questions on it. Um, but one thing that's come crystal clear here is that th this is a very high-tech project, um, and one that there's not a lot of expertise out there. So we, we, want, we do want to make sure that we get high-quality, uh, high-experience contractors to bid on this. Um, and as, as Councillor Yankov said, th this seems to be, at least for a project like this that, that's high tech, it's not, it's not just building a building or building a warehouse. This is a, a high tech project. There's not a lot of people out there with that experience and the timeline to be able to do something like this. And that's our concern. Our, 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 we have a deadline on the, on the funding from the federal government. Um, this is, we're being told, and, and when you talk to people in, in, in the industry, this seems to be the best way to go about it, get the best... Uh, uh, contractors and the best bang for a buck. So, Jessica, I don't know. Did you want to add anything? You want to go through her? Okay. And then, Councilman Tard, your second. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I'll just add. 
a few points. So um, in addition to what our chair said, so this was a recommended practice by our consulting company and by public works engineers. And it is a common practice um, outside of the city of Charlottetown. Um, the big uh, point being time is of the essence. So if we go out to bid and don't get um, a lot of submissions, then we've spent all that time um, you know, lost moving towards project completion. So we want to make sure that we get the bids, we get quality bids, and um, don't run the risk of not having um, a top-notch company to work on this project. And at the end of the day, we might only get two really great bids, and in that case, we spend $20,000. And it's not money wasted, because that money is going towards the design and development of the project. So it's not flushing money down the toilet, it's money that's going towards the, the broader project. And uh, I don't think it's money wasted, but money well spent. If we keep the project on time, we all know time is money. And um, that will be uh, a huge value. Thanks. Councilor Tarrant. Yeah, just to wrap that up, um, it, it's more of principle for me. I think it's not necessarily the, this actual project. I think we did the same with the um, uh, Parkade across the street there, and, and you know, and then what's the next one? I, so I, I think you know, I'm confident. I feel confident that we should be able to get good quality bids across across Canada, North America, wherever they're coming in from, uh, on these uh, specialized projects. And, and if I'm wrong, then so be it. Um, you know, we don't get submissions. We then we look at um, looking to entice people based on that. I think that is kind of what my message here today is: is that we're jumping quickly to figure. Nobody's going to apply for these types of projects. Let's give them money. And that, that's, you know, I, I don't disagree that if we're not successful. So it's not just necessarily about this particular project. I think I'm looking at this now holistically. This is now twice. And I don't know if it was done in the past here. I don't know if it's going to be common, a common practice here. And if it is, maybe we should write it into some policy or procedure around that and how we do that from a financial aspect, as opposed to making these decisions individually every time a big project comes up here. And then we can know that that's built into the process going forward. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Bernard, last comment. I guess, uh, yeah, I guess at the end of the day, um, for me, this seems to become a practice in other areas besides Charlottetown. This is something new for Charlottetown. But we may get bids. The, 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 the question is, are there the high quality ones that we're looking for, are the, the experienced contractors that we're looking for? Um, and that's, I think, what, what the goal is here, is to get an experienced, high quality contractor that we can work with, uh, that we go from design to build to complete the project, and I think that's that's the goal. And I mean, you know, if it becomes common practice or not, uh, I think that depends on the project you're doing. Um, but at the end of the day, as we heard, it, it's common practice in other areas, so it's something that other municipalities are doing. We certainly have to look at it, and that's why it's here before you to vote on it, but this is what the consultants are recommending and what our staff is recommending, and when you talk to the staff about it, the, you get real good reasons why. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. First time I've ever heard of a design build was the uh, Federation Bridge. That was a design build. Okay, Councilor McLear. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Just just a question to the committee: Was there was there uh, discussion at committee? Did it come up that uh, perhaps you, we, it could be looked at through the lens of uh, successful bidder getting a ten thousand dollar refund on the cost of being a successful bid? Or is that coloring, coloring the water too much? Yeah. Councilor McAleer. Uh, Councilor Bernard. Yeah, I think, I think the idea is to get those experienced ones out there to make sure they put a bid in. That's, that's what the goal is. So you know what, if you get 10 bids, staff will, will, will rate them. and It'll be the top three that we're looking for. We only get two, we, we get two, and, and they'll rate them. Thank you. Okay. Question? Question Questions, Carl. All those in favor, please put up your hand. Okay. All those against? Okay. Against. Uh, Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yay. Okay. So, Councillors Duran, Matard, and McAleer. Do you have another resolution? Uh, 
So, there should be two. Yep, and we voted on it. That, sorry about that. Okay, next report is strategic priorities, and that's Mr. Beck. Mr. Councillor Beck. Yeah. Um, because you're not here, and it's been it's 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 difficult to hear your comments on the amendment to the procedural bylaw. Could could we defer that? So that when you're back, and also, I believe Sue, the CAO is back tomorrow. That we could de defer that until the fourth mo fourth Monday. Yeah. Just want I just want to see people. Is that all right, Councillor Beck, or do you want to? No, it's not. I don't think it has. I, I, I think he can wait if. Yeah. If that's the wish of. Yeah. Councillor. Members of council. Yeah. Just one sec, Councillor Twill. Go ahead. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, just stand up. There. Yeah, be, because I mean, we're looking at some dramatic changes here. Yeah. To uh, you know our committee structure, and I feel the committee structure is being watered down or being compromised, uh, going towards you know uh, you know committee of the whole meetings. That's an extra meeting that uh, I don't think any member of council wants to really and truly subscribe to. So I'm not sure what uh, what the motivation is behind. Such a dramatic, uh, dramatic change yeah. uh, to our, our committee structure. I think the committee structure is, is working yeah. out uh, quite well. Doesn't mean we all agree and all the recommendations come forward, but uh, I don't see any major discrepancies or deficiencies, and I'm surprised that uh, you know that this this is even being uh, contemplated and considered. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. We we need to put this off. Yeah. Do, do and, you want to move the deferral? Pardon me. Do you want to move the deferral? Yeah, I'll move the deferral. Yeah. Uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Drone. So, Councillor Beck, can we go through your report when we get to that procedural bylaw discussion? We'll just go with the deferral. Is that all right? Oh uh, yeah, we can defer whenever you want. If you want to vote on it now, or uh, I'm not sure what the process is, but. Uh, Whatever way is fine with me. I'm fine with deferring it, and we can yeah. vote on it now or vote on it later. It doesn't matter to me. So the deferral's on the floor. Um, you calling the question, Councilor Twill? Yeah, defer the whole report? No, no, just the procedural issue. He's got, procedural enough, he's got a resolution there. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's fair. Okay. Question's called. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Do you wish to speak there, Councilor Matart? Sorry about that. Go ahead. I just wanted to verify we're, we're deferring just based on the fact that He's not here to present, and we yeah. can't hear him. And, and also the CAO, she okay. was part of this, uh, these amendments, and I just, I don't that, want to put fine. that on, on Sue's. We're deferring it because we can't hear him. He's not here, and the CAO is not here. Correct. Okay, thank you. Those are the reasons. Good. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Councilor Beck? Yeah. Okay. Fine with me. Can you go with your report? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we met on, uh, <coughs> you'll have to speak up, um, for me, is that better? No, louder. Go outside and start shouting. Speak louder than I am? Yeah. If, if you can. I don't know if I can speak any more clearly. My phone's up to full volume. How's that? Just, Councillor Beck, just one. Councillor McCabe, go ahead. I, I, I think it should be maybe if we're going to defer it, unless there's anything pressing that has to be talked about tonight. It just really is challenging to hear him. So it's, it's hard, unless there's someone on your committee. We can committee defer could, the whole. We can unless someone else in your whole committee whole could go through your report okay. for you, but. Yeah, so can we look at the resolution instead of doing his report, or do you want to defer the whole report? Yeah, or have someone, okay. person on his committee yeah. that could speak to his report, just so that we could, yeah, I'm sure they could summarize for you, Councillor Beck, just it's really hard to hear you in the chamber here tonight. There's nothing really, there's nothing really I would have to add that's not in the report. So if we want to vote on the motion that's there, yeah. we can do that. Yeah, let's, let's go with the motion. Good? We'll go right to the resolution. Okay, Councillor Twill. 
We're going right to the resolution. <laughs> okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Norman Beck, seconded by Deputy Mayor Alana Yankoff. Resolved, whereas the sustainable meetings policy adopted by City Council on June 9th, 2014, intended to minimize environmental impacts when hosting council and committee meetings through the selection of meeting materials while demonstrating commitment to both financial responsibility and sustainability. And whereas residents expect the city of Charlottetown to adopt practices that are more environmentally beneficial, therefore be it resolved that all council and committee meeting agenda packages be circulated electronically. Okay, we got some Councillor Tweel and then Councillor Duran. Councillor Tweel, go ahead. Oh, he's up. He's at the top. I don't know, Bobby was. Okay, Councillor Duran, go ahead. Thank you. And then Councillor McCabe. Andrew, Thank you for your report, Councillor Beck. Um, I, I have a concern with this, you know, uh, as, I, as I find it beneficial myself to, to look up uh, my package. If I, I, I get the package, I can look up. The system up. has detected that a few lines are still connected to the conference and will attempt to disconnect them. If you wish to remain in the conference, please press star 1. 15. To dial out, please dial the area code and number that you wish to connect to the this conference, followed by the pound sign. Press huh? star to return to the conference. Press star. Okay. Ready to go? We're ready to go. Okay, let's I think. start again. I, 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 have a, I have a concern with this, as I find it very beneficial for myself to look at the council package I get or the, the council meeting I, I get the package. And I can look at it, and, and I look at my fellow councillors, and you're always saying, well, what page are we on? And you're trying to flip through your computer. Um, you know, I understand you have sustainability issues or you want to address these issues. But, I mean, we, we look here at council. Those are just words to appease people when we say, okay, we're going to save a tree. I mean, we, we have, we have councillors here. We have CAOs. We have mayors. People travel all over the world now. Why aren't you, why aren't you going on your computer and attending meetings on this way? But you like to you like to do things your way. You travel, you know. That's that's burning up fuel much more than a, a number of papers here. Like I say, it's it's beneficial to myself, and I think Councillor Tweels the the other one that has uh, a few papers here that that we can do. Um, you know, it, it's also in your notes you referred to, you know, eliminating phones in this chamber. As I look here tonight, a lot of people are looking on their phones for notes that they have. You know, they might have scrolled things on there, you know, a picture. And then it's, it's right on your fingertips when you can uh, look at your phone. I, I think, you know, this is, this is not uh, do their job in, a, in an efficient way. And I think each and every one of us uh, look at it this way that we can, we can be responsible. Um, I know you were a principal, um, you know, and, and you look to... To, to us for responsibility. I think we're old enough to be responsible with our phones. And second, you know, like I said, if, if I'm a, a person that I can look at a picture or, or look at information and it's right in my fingertips rather than scrolling, you know, 600 pages on, on the computer, you know, I just ask for consideration from my fellow counselors, uh, you know, to, to not move ahead with this. Thank you. Councilor Tweel. Councilor McCabe, and then the deputy. Um, I, I, um, I guess I understand the motivation trying to eliminate the packages, but uh, I, I find it advantageous having the package in front of me, uh, being able to go back and forth, um, you know, looking at the different committee reports. I find that much more easier for myself. I don't. I don't think we need to eliminate that. I mean, we're not coming up to City Hall here on a daily basis and using truckloads of paper. I mean, we're not. I mean, this is once a month. I, I don't think it's uh, being unreasonable. Uh, I like having that hard copy in front of me, even at the committee meetings. I, I find it much easier to follow along. Um, so I, I don't know what we're trying to achieve here. Um, no, I, I think to each his own. If, if you want to use a computer, use a computer. If you, if you want to use a hard copy, which is in front of you, I, th I think that should be... Uh, I think that should be up to the individual counselor. And with with respect to the phones, I mean, uh, constituents are texting. 
uh, back and forth. They're uh, asking questions. I find it once again prudent and, and, and an advantage to be able to communicate with constituents um, in that regard. And plus, you know, if, if uh, a family member needs to get a hold hold of me, uh, having having the phone there, particularly my mother, I, I want I want to have the I want to have the phone there. So. Uh, uh, I'm not sure again. I mean, I don't see anybody around the chambers abusing their devices. Uh, none of us on this side of the room is in that, in that regard. I don't think anyone on that side of the room is. So uh, I think sometimes uh, I think we can get a, uh, maybe I'm, I don't know if the word is, description is a little carried away, but uh, let's leave it to the individual counselors. And, you know, if there's, there's an abuse of privilege and power, then, then we'll deal with it. But I, I don't see that. The, in the council chamber, I really don't. Okay. So I'll, I'll not be supporting this. Counsel, Councillor Beck, I just have to let you weigh in before I move on. Do you have any comments before well, I? Move? I don't know. If, I, I don't know if people can hear me or not. So it's I don't know whether much it's better. Worth my while to comment. Much better. Keep going. Can people, can you hear me? Can you, hear, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. You, you keep going. You're, the voice, we can hear your voice. I, I guess there's two things. I guess there's two things about it. First off, on the, uh, the uh, I'll, I'll speak to two things. The, I guess I explained it in my report. Um, the, w what we're doing in terms of flipping to reports or flipping to tabs, we can all do that on our tablets far easier than we can do it, or as easily as we can do it in a book list. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, IT people in, on staff here who can help facilitate with that process in terms of making the, uh, working our way through the tablets very easy to do. Um, um, and I know that there are some people who are even not comfortable with the tablets who have adopted them and are making them work. And it's not overly difficult, and I think it's something that in this day and age, um, preparing 667 pages for uh, material that's going to be read and then returned in at the end of the meeting, to me, just does not make any sense when we're looking at trying to promote, uh, promote sustainable practices and whatnot. As far as the phones are concerned, um, the reason I brought that up is because the reality is is that there are some usages in the in the chambers that aren't being that are being done for personal purposes. I've seen them myself, and I think that the uh, that there has to be an expectation that we are in council, that we are present and attentive to what's going on. Um, in terms of being able to be contacted, I understand that there could be emergencies that could arise. Um, we could do that where we have contact could be made through the commissioner downstairs. Uh, contact could be made as well, too. But I think there's a responsibility on us, on our purse, to model good behavior. And um, when we get in the chambers, I think it's important that we, when we're conducting uh, city business, that we be attentive to the city business at hand and not conducting, uh, not using our phones for personal usage. And um, so that's really what that was about. Uh, in terms of moving to the agenda packages, I think it's much more use of our uh, efficient use of our human resources as well, um, that we're not having to spend time preparing documents that really are used for the meetings only and not really done anything done with them after that. So I just think in this day and age, paperless agendas, there's an expectation we have the tools available to us to allow counselors to easily manipulate, find the information, and save the information. That's another thing. You can save all the information that you have and refer to it at a later time. So I just think there's too many advantages um, to uh, not go paper to, to go paperless, and it just makes too much sense in order to be able to do it in this day and age. Okay. Councilor McCabe, thank you, Councilor Beck. Councilor McCabe. Thank you for your reasoning for, for, or for bringing these forward, Councilor Beck, but I, I tend to agree. I think we all have to be respectful that different people learn different ways, require different things in order to learn. I consider myself hybrid. There's 
I'm trying to learn to use the tablet, as you know. Um, I, I use computer all day, but when I'm trying to read and comprehend what I'm reading, I'm much better with a hard copy, so there are things that I require that for. I think we just have to be respectful of where people are with that. As for the phone, it would be the same thing. I'm an adult. If I tend to get on my phone or do something the odd time and need to be brought back or required, I don't feel like I need to be told at 52 years old if I can use my device or if I can't use my device. So I'm glad that's not on the floor tonight. I wouldn't be supporting that. I'm, I tend to be professional most of the time. Sometimes things come up. But I do appreciate it being brought up in the discussion. But um, I won't be supporting moving to paper just because I feel I have to support and we have to be respectful for everybody in here. And good point there, Councilor McCabe. This is not about the cell phones. This is just about the paperless copy, paperless uh, minutes package. And it added to that is, our, I'd say, it says sustainable meetings policy that was passed June 9th, 2014. So I think it runs in line with that. Deputy Mayor? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Buck, for your report. And um, I, I have no issues at all using my tablet and doing the paperless reports. However, I do know that I think we still have a little ways to go. Um, I think that um, we still need that IT support that we don't have in the evenings at meetings. So if my computer, um, you know, does something that I crashes, whatever term we might use, then I need to rely on that IT support. And we, we're not there yet, and I know it's coming, but we don't have that, like we have our managers here for meetings, but we don't have an IT support yet on staff. So although I will continue to use my, my um, tablet, I think maybe we're, maybe we're just a little premature yet, and maybe this is something that we could, um, just defer for six months and maybe revisit this, you know, once we get all of our, um, for lack of a better term, all of our ducks in a row, perhaps. Just throwing that out there. Maybe I'll throw on a deferral on the floor. So, like Deputy Mayor Yankov has proposed, has put on the floor, moved a deferral of this issue for six months, or well, deferral six months or less. Do I have a seconder? Do you have a seconder? Okay. No seconder. Okay, I'm just going to move. Move on. Councillor Matar. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Beck. Um, I guess I should stand up and being an IT professional, it would probably be a miss for me not to mention that uh, I certainly see the value and the benefits to what uh, Councillor Beck is proposing here. Um, and, you know, I think even from day one here, just seeing that, uh, you know, uh, I think eight or ten, eight, eight to nine people are currently using it, I think that's a, a real step in the right direction. Um, and But we're seeing some desire here for others who want to use uh, traditional methods, and I don't see uh, anything wrong with that as well, uh, providing the city staff are still have the capacity and the willingness to, to provide that. Uh, I, know, I know it is a lot of work um, on that end as well, but I think we need to kind of progress into this and the same with cell phone usage. Um, you know, myself personally, I need to have my phone handy for medical reasons. And, you know, I would, you know, not, uh, you know, be forthcoming if I didn't mention, you know, I need to have that there. But I think, again, it's, you know, just using it for uh, practical uses within the council chamber. So. Uh, although all great ideas, I, I feel we're just not quite there yet. And we, we may get there some point in time where we're fully electronic. I'm sure this council chamber has evolved over a course of time. We've got a lot of gadgets on our desktop here that likely weren't here at one point in time. Uh, I think we just need to kind of slowly get there. But I think you're in the right direction here. And um, I don't think we need a resolution to kind of move us towards that. I think we're already getting there. And, and the other council members, maybe over time, they'll adopt it and uh, be receptive to it. Councilor Duran. Councilor Duran. Well, thank you, Mayor Brown, and thank you, Councilor Beck, again. Like, like I said, you know, there's a lot of great points in this debate uh, brought up, and, and I can appreciate everyone. I just don't like being forced. Uh, you know, any other government agencies, whether it's MLAs, member of parliaments, other municipalities, are they doing this, that that everything is, you know, your cell phone or 
you know, you're not, not entitled or not allowed to get a printed copy. Like I say, when, when we sit here and we say this sustainable meetings policy, and I mean, I can understand that. You know, I, I haven't taken a computer since I got elected in, in 2014. I'm still using mine. I still email my client or my uh, residents back. You know, it's working well for me. I don't like to change anything uh, if it's working. So, you know, I don't, I don't have my new tablet, and that was my own, uh, you know, my own idea. I didn't accept it. I didn't vote for it. Again, because I can do things the old-fashioned way and get along pretty well. I can get by to my, my residents and, and everybody can get a hold of me. You know, when we sit here and we, we say one thing about, you know, I believe that we should be sustainable, and then I turn around and I get on an airplane and travel halfway around the world or three-quarters away around the world, and I come back and I say, well, you know, you should be sustainable. So, you know, you can't, you can't have it out of your, both sides of your mouth here. I mean, if you took an airplane to Greece or Italy or Germany, you would burn more CO2 than I would in, in my eight years here. So, you know, don't force things down uh, people's throats. If you're a person that takes this forward, I understand it, but don't, don't talk out of both sides. And, and uh, with all due respect, like I say, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to pinpoint anything, but you're kind of forcing my hand here. So this is why I'm, I'm debating yeah. back. So again, I, I can understand your point, but if it, you know, if it hurts other people's way of learning, I think you should, you know, take it back and, and not force people. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ramsey, I had you there. And then Councillor Bernard. Uh, thank you, Councillor Beck, for your report. And uh, as I look around the room, no one was more slower at this laptop than I was. <laughs> and uh, I looked to Tracy and thank God for Rory next door here. I mean, Justin, thank God he got voted in because he, he's an IT guy, he, and I'm forever asking him. But I'm learning too, but there's nothing more that I enjoyed, I shouldn't say enjoyed, but, but when the package came in on Friday, you had it in front of you, you can take your time reading environmental, you can take your time reading parks and recreation, you can flip back and forth. So I'm like everybody else. I think it's gonna take time for everybody to do it, and I don't think it should be forced upon people. And I know out of 10 people here, there's eight of us that are doing it right now, so we're, you know, we're almost there. So it will take time, but you can't force people to do things. Thank you. Councilor Bernard. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just want to share a story. Uh, I was a little apprehensive when this first came. Um, but you know, maybe some uh, compu computer courses or, or some IT staff can work with some of, the, some of the elected officials. Because when you first get on it, I mean, I was scrolling back and forth. And you know, when you have the binder, you can just flip from tab to tab for information you want not knowing that there's, there's this, uh, an icon here that you can flip from oh, yeah. committee yeah. to committee. So there's different things, I think, that make it a lot easier because what, what's here is the same as our binders. It's the very same. So um, I, I think when you get familiar with it, I think you can get comfortable. Um, but knowing this is here tonight, maybe like, like, like Councilor Yankoff said, maybe, maybe we look at putting a, a timeline on this, whether it be three months' time, just to give other elected officials time to, to get comfortable with it. Yep. I know Councilor McTard and Councilor Bernard, you picked up the pens. They make a great uh, asset. It's a great asset to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. And I know I'm not being called binder boy anymore because I don't have to carry a big binder around. I just take it with my laptop. People who say, here comes binder boy again. Okay. You ready for the vote? Councilor Trio? Or, no, wait, no. I should ask Councilor Beck. I'll come back. Councilor Beck? <coughs> yeah, I'm... I, I'm fine. I stand behind my my thoughts. Um, you know, I'm not getting into a CO2 emission debate on this. This is not what this is about. It's not about traveling by plane or by motorcycle or whatever it might be. Um, so this isn't about that. It's about promoting sustainable practices and using the technology that's available to us. And Councillor Bernard made a, a valid point that what is in binders is in the tablet. And Tracy does a very good job of setting up the documents. And if it takes a little bit of learning, uh, Rory and Taryn Bear are tremendous in terms of helping you na navigate around it. But ultimately, you know what? 
if council so chooses, I put the motion up there to be debated, to be talked about. If uh, the, uh, the feeling of council is to approve it, great. Feeling of the council is not to approve it, I'm fine with that too. So let's have the vote and we'll see where it goes. Council Bernard. No, I, I was just going to make, you know, you reminded me of the pen. I mean, a lot of people oh, may not oh, know that. Too. what? I was just reminded. It's your third time. Can we okay. take the vote? And let's not no think about planes, day. trains, and automobiles. Okay. Question was Kyle, Councillor Drown. Have you called the question? Yes, sir. Call the question. The question is to vote on the resolution. Yay or nay? Yay. Okay. Who's in favor? Please put up your hand. You want to put a friendly amendment? Okay. Well, no, hold on. We, we've deferred. He's saying a friendly amendment. Well, if you call the question, you know what? Yeah. Councillor Bernard, we'll remember that for the future. The question's been called. Okay. All, all, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. One, two, three. Councillor Bernard, are you in favor? The resolution? Councillor McAleer, yay. Councillor McKinnon, Councillor Ramsey, Councillor Beck? Yes. Okay. All those against? 5-5. Five, five. I go with the resolution. So you're not going to be more minded? Well, no. It's a tie. Oh, oh I know you will. <laughs> Well, no, he's what? Talk about bullying. You're forced to do this. That's that's what you get. Councillors, Tweel, McCabe, Duran, Yankoff, A and Matard. Okay. No, no, it's 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 done, guys. Okay. Next item on the agenda. That's it. We have finance, audit, tender, and administration, and that is with. What's that? That was deferred. Yeah. Councilman McClair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, finance Audit Tender and Administration Committee uh, report to Council on November 14, 2023. The Finance Audit Tender and Administration Committee met uh, November 8, 2023 for their uh, regular meeting. Um, included in this package are the draft minutes for that meeting as well as uh, the minutes from uh, October 11th and October 31st. There are three re resolutions included in the package for your consideration. Uh, and in addition, there's a uh, first reading to amend the remuner remuneration bylaw. Number 2020 RMN 01 uh, is attached. Respectfully submit it. Thank you. If there's um, any questions, uh, either myself or Betty will do her best to uh, answer them. Okay, any questions? You have a couple of resolutions? Councillor Drawn. Yeah, just, just on the first resolution, I have a big black mark through it. Is that is that removed or? Okay, thank you. So, do you want to go to? What's that? So, you want to read it? Uh, Your Worship, the uh, first uh, resolution from Finance, Audit, Tendering, and Administration, moved by Councillor John McAleer, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe, be it resolved that the City of Charlottetown will enter into a three-year joint management agreement with CCCMI and Government of PEI for the period of 2023 to 2026 per the attached agreement. And further, that the Mayor and CAO are hereby authorized 
vendor contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Okay. So, Councilor McCabe. Okay, Your Worship and uh, Councilor um, McLear, we, you had pointed out there was something in here, and I'm trying to find the section where the reporting of the financials were not going to be reported any longer. Is that somewhere? Can you remember where you found that? I just want to have it in front of me. It was not going to be reported after a certain January 1st. Do you recall that, Betty, when we talked about yeah. And also with that, I guess I just want to go back to remind, because it's like anything else, we're talking about pushing the province with all the outreach center stuff and accountability and who they are. When we have these boards that sit under us, I'd like to remind us that we need to have some accountability come back so we have some regular presentation, whether it's their financial report, whether it's something so that we're seeing it a little bit more often than taking dates out of the contract that we see that a little bit more frequently. So we could add that maybe to our next finance meeting to try and put something a little bit clearer in place so that we're holding people a little more accountable when we're responsible for that. But do you recall where that was, Your Worship? Yeah, I, I'm looking for it now. And Councilor McAleer, do, are you, do you have the agreement there in front of you? <clears throat> yeah. Ar Article six. Yeah. What what section is it? Article six, uh, section. Article a. six. And it specifically says there, uh, and it's in red, so it's been newly added. Payments will be issued quarterly, subject uh, to receipt of the latest unaudited quarterly financial statements, along with an invoice. Yeah. And actually, that's, that's something that I'm not aware of happening right now. They submit a quarterly invoice, but not an audit. That's different than what we saw at, at committee, too. I don't think it read that way, if no, I recall. No, that's how it read. I'm, oh, I'm it was? It wasn't changed. changing. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. But if we got a quarterly financial statement, an audited statement every quarter, I think that would be really helpful. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Good. Any other questions about it? Councilor McKay, okay. good. Okay. Councilor Drawn. I see in the uh, uh, financial implications that, you know, we're an 80, 80 20 percent, yeah. um, you know, and it has been that way. But any unforeseen deficits, so if, if they go and spend extra money or something happens, we're on the hook for that. Um, you know, that, that concerns me. It just... You know, we used to meet with them and, and discuss budgets, all, all this stuff. When they did come in here the other day and, and meet with us, and, and I kind of moved it forward for council discussion, but, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I just had some concerns over it. Oh, yeah. So do I. You know, I think we concentrated too much on the audited statements. Yeah. But if they give us quarterly invoices, no. spend on their budget like if we were looking at that quarterly they shouldn't be able to get that far out of the gate in a quarter would would they I would well, suspect that we would be monitoring that more closely if we're going to receive before we give payment we're to receive those yeah. audited or it, those in the present agreement there Councilor McCabe do you see uh, number six article six uh -huh. we're yeah. obligated to uh, provide 749,000 the change is now 80 percent There's no number. 80, 20. Yeah. We own 80%. So why wouldn't we have to pay 80%? So you're all right with that. So there's now it's 794, and if they have to ask for more, they have to make a request. But if it's all but, right, 80%. Well, if you own 80%, I would assume you would pay 80%, yeah. wouldn't you? I, I don't know. I'm not a bit, I'm working a school for. Salary. I don't work in business, but that's how I'd see it. Okay, Councillor McAleer. I I think that um, we should uh, take this back to committee and um, just uh, go at it uh, a little further. Um, as uh, as the uh, 
is uh, also have some question for them as well on their uh, on their financial statement that uh, I'd like yeah. to get a little more information on. So you want to defer it? Okay. So he's asking for a deferral on this. Yeah. Yeah. We're all right. Okay. Deferred. Need a mover. Councillor, second by Councillor McKinnon. Okay. Question? No. Do you, no, do you want to speak to it? Go ahead. Yeah. If we're eighty percent, the province is twenty percent. But as Councillor Drong stated, why, if there's something goes wrong, why do we pay for it? Uh, I mean, we should be paying 80 cents in the dollar, right? Is that explained out there that the province puts in the other 20 cents on the dollar? Or is it? Betty, maybe I'm missing that part. Yes, they, they're the other 20%. Oh, yeah. it is. It is. If the plant goes, for example, we only pay 80% to, to have it up and running again. And then the province puts in their 20 percent, correct? Okay, thank you. Okay. Resolution on the floor to defer it. Go ahead. Yep. And and forgive me, it's it's nearly eight o'clock after a long day of work and then almost three hours here. When you own 80 percent, how do you not pay 80 percent? Can someone explain that to me in in grade three language? So I comprehend. Like, I don't understand what we're going back for. We own 80% of the carry. Therefore, you pay 80%. Regardless if it's 794 that was in the original one, I would see this as being something that would carry on so you don't have to come back and identify numbers every year based on a budget. But you're 80% shareholder, you pay 80%. Betty, am, am I missing something? No. no. That's how I would understand it. Yeah. Councilor Bernard. When we're eighty percent, Councilor Bernard. Thank you. So, so the, the dollars that we were budgeting, the seven ninety four per year, was that eighty percent? No, uh, probably at the time, because it was the last time it was amended was I think two eighteen. Okay. Okay. So that that was eighty percent mm -hmm. before. So, okay, doesn't matter, because that's where the figure came from. So. Yeah. And I. Do you want to try? Okay. I, I just before you do. I, Article three about the terms of uh, contract uh, for the is that the membership for the membership I think for the boards they wanted it, it will will it be every four years or every three years it says here directors shall be appointed for a three year term is that current that is currently the situation correct for a maximum of six years. so do you want to explain that can I ask you about number three. Or number four, sorry, Article Four of the Board. A lot of questions. Why don't you just take it back and answer in three minutes? There needs to be a lot of questions. That's what I'm saying. Furl's on the floor. Who's moved it? Councilor McClary, you moved it. Councilor McKinnon, seconder. Councilor Twills, deferral. Yeah, that, that's why the deferral's on the floor. She can speak to it. So the deferral's on the floor. Uh, Sue, do you want to speak to it? Yes, Your Worship. There seems to be a lot of confusion. It's probably because there's not a lot of corporate memory on uh, on this particular agreement, but I worked with Stan McPherson when we drew it up the first time around. And uh, something that should be understood right out of the gate is that um, there's two sections of that complex. One is owned by the province. It's not the same as Cary. One, one section is owned by the city of Charlottetown, which is the arena. The other side is owned by the province. And when they did the financial um, work on what it cost to operate each of those elements, they came up with that original formula of 80-20. And it's always been 80-20. We've just never, for some reason, in just in recent years, the actual amount of money got put into the joint management agreement. So it did used to say 80-20. And, and the Civic Center and the, or yes, the Civic Center Management Inc. Board managed the operation as such that it was never an issue with the amount of money that was being asked from one budget year to the next. There was financial reporting was happening on a regular basis. Um, it used to be two parks and recreation and then it got switched in recent years to finance. There is some, some language changes in here around board structure and that type of thing to, to your point, your worship. Um, 
that I'm not familiar enough on to speak to, but I can speak to the 80-20 piece. And I know enough about from being on the board with Civic Center that when you're looking at the operations there, almost 90% of their costs are fixed costs. Uh, so there's not a lot of wiggle room for them to go out and uh, take lavish trips on jets and, and have fun at um, uh, great staff parties and such. It's all fixed costs. And a lot of those fixed costs, you also have to remember, are city employees. So on the arena side, there is our own QP501 people, and we're the ones that set their wages and benefits. So if you look at the financial statements and look at wages and benefits for the Civic Center, a lot of that are costs we're dictating to the Civic Center. So to... To, I guess my point is we can't have it both ways. We can't tell them they have to manage within a certain amount of money as was put in a few years ago. Uh, we have to expect them to, res to operate in a fiscally responsible manner under the 80-20 premise. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. With the directors and... and it's pretty clear. I mean, we get to appoint a whole lot of people to a board. They have three years, and then they have a chance to go for three more, but that's it. And then new people come in and, and do it. I don't know why we'd have to go back and, and look at that either at committee level. I think that's pretty good. So with the uh, <coughs> continued discussion that's uh, come about here and with further clarification with... Uh, with uh, CAO uh, Sue, uh, Sue Fraser, um, we can perhaps leave the resolution as is. Well, you, get, you get a deferral on the floor, so vote for it or vote against it. Okay. Question on the deferral. All those in favor of the deferral, please put up your hands. Okay. Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Uh, there seems to be too much confusion, so I'd vote in, I'd vote in favor of that. Okay, all those against the deferral, please put up your hand. Go ahead. Is, is, is there still a lot of outstanding questions? For me, is that the only yeah. one, the 80-20? Yeah, there is. There is. Um, that's, I'm just asking for, deferral was asked for, and if it goes to a tie, I'll vote for the deferral. Okay. Do you want a deferral? Yes or no? Okay, so against the deferral, McCabe, Matart, Ramsey, uh, Councillor McAleer, Councillor Bernard, and the Deputy. And four, Twill, Councillor Duran, McKinnon, and uh, Councillor Beck. Okay, so deferral was defeated, and so the resolution's back on the floor. Okay, question for the d resolution? Question called. All those in favor of the resolution on the floor? Okay, Councillor McKay, Matart, Ramsey, McKinnon, uh, McAleer, Bernard, Deputy Mayor, Yankov, Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, those against? Councillor Duran and Twill. Okay, A2. Okay, John, do, you, do we have another resolution? Your Worship, the second resolution from Finance, Audit, Tendering, and Administration, moved by Councillor McAleer, John McAleer, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe. Be it resolved that the City of Charlottetown enter into a purchase agreement to obtain outright ownership of the residential property at 54 Maple Avenue for 340000 and further that the Mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Okay. Councillor Tron. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, we're here tonight to, to hopefully purchase the residential property at 54 Maple Avenue. Um, as many of the councillors <coughs> know, I, I have been asking uh, about a new community centre, about a possibility of a renewal of Cody Banks. Um, this property would be key in, in having that area to revitalize our community in Ward 6. Uh, you know, I, I certainly voted for in favor of Simmons or other big projects to benefit the city. Now, it, I, I believe it's, it's near our time uh, for Ward 6. 
you know, we have a building here, community center, that was hauled from the airport, I think, in 1962. It's been patched up. It's been, you know, Band-Aid solution. There's questions about, you know, air quality there. You know, uh, you know, the next door neighbor, you know, this, this building, there, there's a house. There was questions about air quality with the oil spill. The lady was successful enough to, to get a property and move to Council Bernard's area. So, you know, I asked Council tonight to, to consider this. It's a good piece of the puzzle for uh, a revitalization of, of the Ward 6 area around the Cody Banks rink and give our community a nice, healthy community center where they can go in safety if there's, there's issues arise due to storms or hurricanes. This would be a meeting place. You know, I think I went through three, three CAOs and, and, and this current CAO has kind of, you know, agreed to, to look at what needs to be done to see if we could, uh, you know, make a change here. And, you know, I'll, I'll give her a, a, a shed out for that. She was willing to sit with me and, and talk about this. So I asked council to please consider this. This would be a great piece of the puzzle. And again, if there's a community center in your area, you know, the next year, I'd certainly be willing to support it. So okay. thank you. Deputy Mayor Yankoff, Council Tweed, and then Council Turd. Thank you, Your Worship. And um, this journey um, certainly began long before my time on Council. But from listening to the meeting the other day and reading through the report, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. And um, I most definitely will be supporting this. Thank you. Councilor Tweed, and then Councilor Turd. Oh, great. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, he's ahead of you there. I want to uh, want to echo uh, Councillor Bob Duran. Uh, I think with the anticipated replacement of Cody Banks Arena, and it's going to be nice to have that space. Gives us more flexibility, a lot more room. Um, you know, uh, again, this is a great opportunity for the city of Sherrilltown, and, and Bob is quite correct. Um, we we need to uh, we need to uh, put all our efforts together uh, when a new facility is constructed, and certainly a community component, which you have been advocating for the past several years. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think this is a good investment uh, for the taxpayers of the city of Charlottetown, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see uh, huge dividends. We're going to need this space. I can tell you that. We're definitely going to need this space. Uh, if you look at what we've done with Simmons and the new pool. I'd like to emulate that uh, with the replacement of Cody Banks rink and, and maybe even a pool. So this, this, this is truly a necessity. It's very important from a parks and recreation perspective. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Tart. Thank you. Uh, I echo a lot of those comments. I want to show my support to Councillor Duran for this initiative. Uh, certainly was well before my time, but you know I'm coming in at the end here and I'm seeing a lot of great potential for revitalizing that particular area, including a brand new school that's being built, Sherwood School. Uh, ideally, it'd be great to see a brand new rink complex there, dual pad, and a community center. So I think this property will um, certainly contribute to that vision and I hope that that is something that we see come to fruition over the next couple of years. Thank you. Twin pad, did you say? Twin pad? Space is there? Okay. Question? Question's called. All those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Councillor Beck? Yay. Okay. Thanks for the nice suit. Third resolution, Your Worship, from Finance Audit, Tendering and Administration, moved by Councillor John McAleer, seconded by Councillor Julie McCabe. Be it resolved that Council reject the attached request to purchase city property at the northeast corner of Queen Street and Pond Street, PID number 368001, and continue to hold this parcel of land. Okay. Questions called? Questions. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Beck? Yay. Okay. That's it. Bylaw? Yeah. Uh, Your Worship, we have uh, a 
first reading of a remuneration bylaw amend the City of Charlottetown remuneration bylaw number 2021 RMN01 to implement the recommendations from the Remuneration and Allowances Commission as outlined in the report as pre presented to Council on October 12, 2023. Resolve that. The bylaw to amend the City of Charlottetown Remuneration Bylaw 2021 RMN01 be read a first time. Shall I carry? Okay, all those in favor, uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yay. Okay. Uh, contrary? Councillor Drawn, 9 1. Yeah. Resolve that the bylaw now be approved as a city bylaw and that it be entitled the City of Charlottetown Remuneration Bylaw 2021 RMN 01 and that it be read a second time at the next public meeting of council. Okay. Shall I carry? Pass. Contrary. Councillor Beck, yay or nay? Yay. 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 Yay or nay? Yay. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Next report. That's it, Councillor McAleer. Okay. Hello. Human Resources, Councillor Matart, and I see that uh, your manager's out there. The system has detected Just that a second. few lines are still connected you know to the conference over. and will attempt to you know disconnect that. them. If you gone. wish to remain in the conference, please press star one. If to dial out, please dial the area code and number that you wish to connect to the conference, followed by the pound sign. Press star to return to the con. Press star. We'll change that. Okay. Council return. My attempt to be funny was ruined by that, but nonetheless, thank you very much for the report tonight. Uh, the HR committee did not meet since our last uh, uh, council meeting, regular council meeting, um, so there are no resolutions. If there are any questions, I can do my best to address any HR. We also have our manager, Emily, here tonight with us. If there's any questions you would like, I can direct those towards her. Okay. Councilor Twill. Uh, thank you, Councilor Matart. Thank you for responding to my inquiry about uh, city staff picking up uh, needles, drug paraphernalia, crack pipes throughout the city of Charlottetown. Uh, I have some concerns about uh, city staff uh, undertaking that responsibility, uh, considering that it's not a program that we're involved with. We, we, we're not involved with uh, the distribution of drug paraphernalia. And I'm, it, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that the onus and responsibility is on the city of Charlottetown to clean up city parks. Um, sports fields, rails to trails, historic squares, cities right away. I don't know why we've taken on that responsibility when we're not involved with the program in any which way, shape, or form. Uh, that's a service in kind. That's costing um, additional resources for the city of Charlottetown. I'm concerned about the uh, safety and security of our employees particularly parks and recreation and public works. I'm, I'm concerned that if one of them was to pick up a needle, whether it be you know, uh, you know, hepatitis C, uh, laced with fentanyl, uh, crystal meth, or HIV, uh, then the question becomes who's ne negligent, who's responsible, and who falls on the sword. I, I don't know where the directive came from for our city staff to be doing that. I think the responsibility lies with the provincial government, Premier's office. They're, they're involved with these programs and the feds. And uh, I think the onus should be put on them. I mean, you, you, you're sponsoring the program, then you should be cleaning it up. It shouldn't be up to our staff. That's, that's the old trickle-down economics. And I don't think it's fair to our city staff and the city's corporation to take on a responsibility where we can be truly, truly negligent. Yeah. And, and, and um, I, I, I think if you could please uh, bring that up to your uh, committee meeting, next committee meeting, I think we need to A, 
uh, send a bill to the Premier's office for the services and kind that we're providing. And I think they need to come up with a methodology to go out and to clean up the, uh, the crack pipes and, and the uh, drug paraphernalia and needles that are on the cities right away. We're not involved in that program. I don't think we should be involved with that responsibility. And I do not agree with that so-called trickle-down economics where the onus is on the city of Charlottetown and more specifically, the city's corporation. I okay. want to thank you again for your response. You. The email you sent to me, I appreciate that. But uh, I, I know that this is tiresome for our staff, and, and a lot of them are not comfortable taking on this responsibility. And, and, and I agree, and I support them wholeheartedly. Okay, thank you. Councilor Chard. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tweel. Um, you know, I do, I do have the same concerns that you have as well, and I noted that in the communication um, when speaking to our manager. Uh, you know, I've spoken to a number of staff at Public Works and just in passing, and was surprised to hear that staff are required to pick up um, you know, hazardous material, whether it be needles, garbage. Uh, you know, I have an exception with our sending our public works out to clean up unsightly properties where there's all kinds of garbage as well. So, uh, and certainly, you know, when it comes to the hazardous material that we're seeing, needles, uh, drug <coughs> paraphernalia, et cetera, in and around our parks, our pathways, our, our city street sidewalks, it is becoming certainly... Um, uh, a very tricky situation because there is going to be a situation in due time if there already hasn't been and not sure how that's going to be addressed and what liability as you indicated will occur. Uh, we, we have put forward in the uh, applications or the applicants for the Park Street uh, shelter have put in there as part of one of their terms and conditions that they would provide cleaning services uh, for that in and around our parks and pathways in that vicinity. Uh, I believe from the announcement that was made but potentially for the application that's coming for the Park Street um, uh, Every Center, they also too indicated something about that as well, of putting a dedicated crew together to uh, clean up and stuff. But I, I still don't think it's enough. I, I think that uh, we need to address this. Again, I know it's an HR issue and I'll give uh, manager uh, Emily an opportunity to speak here. I know it's an internal thing. I don't know if it's union based. There's lots of probably things that need to be considered here and figure out you know, what uh, uh, for the staff that are required to do that is other duties as required. Um, they do have the training apparently. So that, I mean, I'm glad to hear that that is there regardless. There is training, there is uh, first aid kits, there is a flushing um, kit. I, I wash station, I guess they call it. So they have put some mitigations in there, but nonetheless, it is still, uh, you know, dangerous situation to, to, for staff to be involved in. And, and, you know, you think maybe two, three, four, five years ago, city staff probably weren't doing anything like that. And no. now there's, you know, it's everywhere you turn. I mean, I've called myself as a counselor to have someone come down and clean up the area because that was the only mechanism to have somebody clean up and, and, you know, it was clothes and garbage and stuff all strewn all over the parking lot. Um, so I'm going to give uh, the, Emily an opportunity just to elaborate on that. And Emily, if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, the, the challenges that we may face in, in dealing with this uh, situation yeah. for staff. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important that we address this. Yeah, I know. Just before and, Emily sorry, uh, yeah. gives her opinion, I know that Councillor Twill has another question, but Councillor Twill. Let her, we need to get a resolution to extend for another 15 minutes. Move by Councillor Bernard, second by Councillor, uh, oh, no, Deputy Mayor Yankup. Uh, okay, it's, all on, it's on the floor. Who's in favor? Please raise your hand. Against? Okay. Councillor Beck, we don't need your vote. <laughs> Anyways, 10 0. Okay. Yeah. Emily? Thank you, Worship. Um, just to reiterate and echo uh, Councillor Matart's comments, there are union uh, lines there in terms of co collecting garbage, cleaning up um, parks and other areas throughout the city. So that would have to be a conversation to have with the union. Um, I did want to talk about the programs and policies we do have in place to mitigate any safety risks 
that our staff may be facing right now. We do have a safe handling of sharps policy, um, the health and safety program. The individuals who are responsible for cleaning up the uh, sharps and paraphernalia being uh, found in parks right now, uh, through other locations throughout the city, um, they are provided with the appropriate training, personal protective equipment. Um, there are eye wash stations in the duty crew trucks, and it is duty crew who are designated to be picking up those sharps or other uh, hazardous materials. Um, any staff that do come across any sharps or hazardous materials are and are not comfortable picking it up, um, as per the policy, can contact duty crew or the, the uh, respective manager. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can we move on to the next report? Councilor Twiller. Uh, to who? Which? Just to follow up, thank you for your response. But um, I'm going to dig in on this one. I don't think it's up to the city of Charlottetown to clean up uh, drug paraphernalia, crack pipes, and needles. Yeah. It's not a program that the city of Charlottetown is executing and, and providing the residents of this city. I, I think. You know, I think the onus has to go back to the province. And I think what also needs to happen, too, is I'd like to know how much money, how much time is spent, staff time is spent on picking up these hazardous materials. And we need to uh, do up a bill and send that down to the Premier's office. And furthermore, I'd like to know where does the chief medical officer of this province, where is the chief medical officer? When all these hazardous materials are all over the city of Charlottetown, what 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 role does she play? I mean, she knows this, she, this is happening. It's happening all over her city. It's happening on the school grounds. It's happening everywhere. And like, this is this is some kind of a dynamic or phenomenon that's just evolved over the last couple of years to the extent that it is now. And where where is the chief medical officer? And how come she's not weighing in on this? Yeah. This this is a health hazard. It's dangerous, and to, to, to have this become uh, an accepted norm in our city, I, I don't agree with it, and I know a lot of people don't. And I'm, I'm really concerned about the safety of our workers. I mean, I, I think we need to go to bat for our workers. I really do. Thank okay. you. Okay, let's... You want to wrap it up? I just wanted to follow up. Uh, thank you, Councillor Tweel. Um, uh, those are all great. They're valid points. And I, I, I stand behind uh, many of those as well. And what I'd like to do is just take this offline here now, and we will come up with and see what's available to us um, and dig into this a little deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next report, Protect Emergency Services Committee. I have to leave. Deputy has to take over. Go ahead, Councillor Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Protective Emergency Committee met, I can't even read here now, October 24th. Uh, the minutes are in your package. There are three resolutions for you for, for your consideration. Any questions? I'll certainly try to answer them if I can. The Deputy Fire Chief and the Police Chief are here. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, Council McKinnon. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ramsey, for your report. Uh, just a question. Earlier this year, I'd asked about a review of our bylaws, uh, making them more enforceable, and what's the status of our bylaws being synced under the Summary Proceedings Act? The I know our ticket, our bylaws now, they can write a ticket. It's a long information, but the bylaw officer just can't write in now, and a lot of our bylaws can't just give a summary of fence ticket. Uh, I think it was August, they said it was gone back to legal to be looked at, and I'm just wondering what, where that process stands right now. Thank you for your, your question, Councillor McKinnon. Chief Brad McConnell. Could you tell us where we're at at that stage of the program? Thank you. 
Deputy Mayor, uh, Councilors, um, what I can tell you, it's still it's still under review. It's uh, something uh, we've been working on to find a, uh, a path forward because we know um, our bylaws right now are are struggling to be relative in some areas, and uh, we're hoping to uh, to find a path forward. There is a big legal component to this, and. Uh, and um, but uh, we're not uh, we're not at the point where we can have anything um, to put before a council or committee. Okay, uh, Councillor Twill. Thank you. Um, today, in the front page of the Guardian, a constituent of Bayfield Street expressed her frustration, her fear and anxiety, and wanted to move off the street because of what was taking place at a particular residence. That's been quite evident, quite clear that this has been problematic for this neighborhood for uh, last two or three years. So, you know, uh, police have been contacted and you know, there's uh, presence. Things have happened. Recently, there was a fire, and we have a single parent on the front page of the Guardian. That's uh, truly troubled, and I don't blame her. I don't blame her one bit. So, we often hear about being proactive. Now, if you go back to December the 9th, 2019, I moved a resolution supported by Councillor Bob Duran, passed unanimously. The resolution reads like this, whereas there is a continued concern for the existence of individuals conducting illegal activities such as selling of drugs from their residents, and whereas there is a need to hold these individuals and property owners accountable so to ensure health and safety for all residents of the city of Charlottetown are protected, in particular our youth, and whereas the Prince Edward Island is one of the two provinces that have not yet enacted the civil forfeiture sta statutes. Therefore, be it resolved, the City Council support the creation of a provincial civil forfeiture law as a means for government to seize criminals, criminals, property, and fight organized crime. And further, that the City write Dennis, Premier Dennis King to ask his government to cr create such a legislation. Now, as a follow-up to that, the City of Summerside also passed a resolution. Furthermore, City Council petitioned the Federation, the Prince Edward Island Federation of Municipalities, and that resolution passed um, in early 2020 of that year. So here you have two major municipalities supporting the forfeiture law, which give our police department the opportunity to go in and seize these assets because of the harm that it's causing that particular neighborhood. The Federation of Municipalities, all members supported that. That was unanimous right across the province. And I was grateful for that. So the request was sent down to the Department of Justice and no surprise, no action. Didn't want to didn't want to act on it. So could the fire and the activities that were happening at, on, on this particular house on Bayfield Street, could that have been avoided? I believe it could have been avoided. I really do, because the forfeiture law would enable our police department to go in and do the work that they need to do. Resolution was passed last, last week, private member's bill on the government side, talking about safe neighborhoods and drug houses and all that kind of stuff. Well, there it is right there. Resolution passed by city council back in 2019. Resolution passed by the city of Summerside and by the Federation of Municipalities. I don't know what we have to do to get the message across to this government that we need the tools and we need the vehicles and avenues to be able to deal with this. There, that was unavoidable as to what took place in Bayfield Street. My heart goes out to that constituent, and I did try to relay her message to the police department on a number of occasions. So I think that's something that we have to uh, revisit. Whether, we, whether I do it under new business or, or uh, later under, uh, or maybe send this off to police, 
this was brought in under new business, but I can tell you that we've got some serious situations in this city. And the biggest one is the Charlottetown Outreach Center. Councillor Tweel, do you have a question? No, I have a, I just wanted to bring this forward, particularly for the new members of City Council that weren't aware, and furthermore, to reiterate to the councillors that were here that supported it. Um, we've got some serious issues here, and, and I don't know why. My question is, I, I guess we need to do it from an elected point of view, but I wanted to bring this to the point. When I read that today in the front page of The Guardian, plus it was in the media before, um, you know, I'm really troubled by that. And, and here's this poor single parent trying to find another place to, to live because she's afraid, her child's afraid, and I talked to another constituent across the street like they've had it. Why is it that these things are happening in our community, and yet when we go ask for the tools for our police department, the Department of Justice says no. I mean, talk about a real disconnect. I don't know, Chief, if you have something you'd like to add to that, but... Uh, I'm very frustrated. I really am. I'm really frustrated with the lack of response from the, from the province, and in particular, the Department of Justice. Okay. And I agree with you 100%, Councillor Tweel, and we feel for the residents on Bayfield Street. But once again, we as a city council and me as chair, that's <coughs> operational. We're, like we can't go tell our, our, our officers or our police chief this is happening and this is happening in Maplewood Crescent, this is happening in Bayfield Street, this is happening in Houston Street. They're looking after things and we're going to support them as much as they can and I would imagine in my own personal view that they know what's going on on certain streets. But as you stated, if it's stopped by, if it's stopped by the province, I mean some of the there's times our hands are tied with our police departments that. If they don't give them the right to go into these places, I mean, what are you going to do? And I understand what you're saying, and you're frustrated with it. We're all frustrated on what's going on in this in the city of Charlottetown. But, you know, we've got to stand behind our police officers, and we've got to do, preserve the people that are on the front lines. I mean, they know what's going on. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't want to know. But I, at the same time, it's operational, and we've got to let, the, let these people do their jobs. Uh, Deputy Mayor Councils, um, I think great points, and certainly the police department is supportive of any uh, tools uh, to help us deal with these challenging issues. Thank you, and I believe our CAO, acting CAO, has a, a few comments uh, on this file. I do have some familiar familiarity with it, Deputy Mayor. It's getting it's long in the night to be using long words. I shouldn't do that. Um, but there, to Councillor Tweel's point, this resolution went forward quite some time ago and it seemed to have stalled out um, in that. I think the Department of Justice was looking for us to sit down and work with them to provide some evidence-based um, uh, activities of what exactly it was that was stalling out that we couldn't get movement on it in order to justify this type of action. So I think maybe the takeaway for us this evening would be to regroup on this and work with the Department of Justice to present the, all the evidence as to why it is we need to move forward with this type of, uh, this type of legislation. So I think that's, that's our next step, I think, is just circle back on this and see what exactly they need to move forward. Yes. Okay, thanks for that. Now, folks, it's 8.15. It's been a long night. Councillor Duran would still like to speak, but I'm going to need first. Can I? Can we? You know, buy ten more minutes, folks. Sure. So who's going to move that for me? Okay. That's what it was the last time. No, it's okay. Okay. That's just what. That's what's what the mayor had said. Okay. So. In essence of time, Councillor Duran has a question. You go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and, and thank you, Councillor Ramsey. And thank you, Councillor Tweel, for bringing this, this to the forefront once again. Um, I've attended uh, the two meetings that you put on, one in front of the legislature, uh, and, you know, I, I attended both meetings, and I talked to the people. I read your report, uh, Chief McConnell, 
about uh, concerned citizens. I attended the Birchwood, you know, and I, I feel for the people, um, you know, they're, they're scared, they're terrified. Whenever you're attending these meetings, they tell you real stories that break your heart and living in fear. Uh, again, I, I get an update probably every hour from my wife telling me about Johnny McDonald's North of Houston Post, and what's going on. So this affects me quite a bit. I see these people uh, struggling. Uh, I see them scared. You, you read the paper as soon as you wake up in the morning and you see a, a young lady and her son terrified. What are we going to do? What's the solution? You know, I talk to these people. They say, please don't move it down the road a little bit. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what we're supposed to do. But last month, I asked you, Councillor Ramsey and Mayor Brown, our CAO and Councillor Beck, and with the police chief to get a meeting with the, with the province to see if they can implement what the Department of Justice did in BC to, to outline drug usage in public places, uh, close to various buildings, to schools. There was a whole list. Uh, I remember if we, if we read the article in the paper, as you did and I did and the police chief did, but I asked for a meeting. So now we're here the next month. Has there been a meeting, you know, scheduled? Is there going to be a meeting scheduled? You know, I'm, I'm looking to try to come up with a solution to probably give the police more, you know, uh, more skills, more powers. You know, if, if BC can struggle with this and they're a year or two ahead of us of what's been going on, what's the delay in getting our legislation? The, the government is sitting now, you know, can we piggyback on their legislation? It would just be an easy call or an email to see what their legislation is, to see if we can implement it. So I ask you to please get this meeting. The CAO is back in again tomorrow to get this meeting with the people in place here that I've asked last month and to get the police some more powers to do their job. I mean, we're struggling with this. This is a daily thing, you know, in our city where people don't feel safe, they're scared. You know, I, I get calls in my area from elderly people, their, their car's been rifled through, you know, and every night I go to bed now, it's lock the cars, lock the doors, you know, keep the lights on. You know, it's, it's, it's a different city. And, you know, if, if, if police need more manpower or woman power, then we have to do it at budget time to get it. And like I say, you know, I ask for these tools to help the police do their job better. So thank you. And thank you for giving me the extra time tonight. In a week or so, Councilor Drawing, and that'll be on the agenda for sure. And then we'll talk to CAO and the police chief and see if we can set something up. And I agree with you. It's, and you hit the nail on the head when you said it, it is not the same city. And it's not. Like this city really changed in the last seven or eight to 10 years. Well, even before that, even the last five years, it's really gone. But, you know, we're, tr we're trying to do our best who, 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 with the Charlotte Police Services from what the resources we have and the manpower we have. And, and if we can get a meeting and have, have these other parties work with us, I think it's going to improve a bit. I, I don't know if, we, if it's ever going to clean everything up, because it's not. Because from what I've been seeing and talking to people, Moncton's a mess, Sackville's a mess, Snell's, Halifax is a mess. Summerside's even bad because I, I, I talked to a gentleman at the hockey game about that too. <clears throat> he he just said, we're the capital city, it's hitting us, we're in the press, but we're, 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 we're certainly working on it and our police service is there too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Uh, Councillor McCabe, and then we'll move on to our resolutions. And um, thank you. I, I think as much as I agree with Bob, I think I'm reading uh, the report when we look at your downtown strategy. Since September 3rd, um, there's been dedicated foot patrol put in the area. There's been minimizing police availability. We're getting out there. We're being more visible. The cost of that resource on the city already were, were indicated $24,000 or something. Um, there's been a zero tolerance trespassing that you committed to. And since September 3rd, we're on November 17th, 
there's been 59 charges late. I mean, that's telling us that the police are listening and trying their best based on what we have the ability to do. And perhaps at your next committee, you look at something around the low-hanging fruit of the drug issue in our city. How can we get over some of the barriers? This is the federal catch and release program. There's, you know, the new drug initiatives and stuff. Like, we need to be looking at what can we be doing. We're all in support. We all want this problem to go away. But I, I think we need to celebrate some of the positive things that have happened and recognize that we're, we are hearing what the people are saying. We feel the pain that they feel like they're being held hostage within their own community. It's not okay. Nobody's out there celebrating that piece. But we have to celebrate that they are hearing it. We are trying. We have to do a lot more. And we're all committed to do that. Thank you for those for those kind of remarks because I did receive uh, a few emails and our police chief did from some of the residents after that meeting at Birchwood, not from everybody, but from some of them saying they're very, they're very proud that, that they've seen more police officers around and they're doing things. And as you stated, we had we made 59 arrests for uh, that. And then uh, the other thing too, which I was surprised and chief brought up at our meeting last month, within 30 days since our, his meeting, our overtime was $25,000, you know. So we are doing that, but I, at the same time, we need the resources and, and the financial thing. So it, there is some people seeing a little bit of an improvement, as I keep stating. It's all not going to go away tomorrow. It's all steps. It's all steps, and we're hoping to do it. And uh, I mean, the sooner the better. So thank you. Councillor Tweel. Your second time. last few weeks for for the last two and a half years it's been torture 100%. okay it's been torture this community's felt abandoned and we got a long way to go I've said this before I'll say it again we got a long way to go turn their confidence and earn their trust it's not going to happen overnight when I brought up the forfeiture law here today I was being proactive back a few years ago and all council supported it so did Summerside so did the Federation of municipalities all members supported that and yet, it's sent down to the province, it's to give our police department the tools that they need to be, able, to be able to go in and deal with these situations. These are dangerous situations. Extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous for the people that are living adjacent to these properties. You know, single parents trying to raise their kids and, and wondering, can, am I going to go to bed tonight and what's going to happen? What's going to happen at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning? And this could have been avoided. And I think the provincial government owns responsibility for this. I really do. This could have been avoided. So I don't know what we have to do. I know they're having discussions over there in the legislature about the outreach center. And they're saying, you know, get on board and do this and do that. Really? After two and a half years, you just got a long way to go over there. From the premier's office all the way down. Like I said, don't tell me, show me. And I haven't seen anything from this province. Well, and uh, that'll be on our agenda too, Chief, in two weeks' time of why he was stalled at the uh, Department of Justice when Somerside approved it and Charlottetown approved it and all that. Just see where we're at with that as our CAO brought up. And, you know, we, we, we'll have that discussion, Councillor Trio. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, resolution number one. Yeah, Protective and Emergency Services uh, Committee Resolution 1, moved by Councillor Kevin Ramsey, seconded by Councillor Norman Beck. Resolved that the Public Works Manager be authorized to cut grass, remove any trees, garbage, and other materials or debris, dangerous or otherwise, clean up and properly dispose of same at the owner's expense at the following properties located at 75 Kindred Avenue, PID number 114058. Warning posted on October 17th, 2023. Pictures taken. Satisfactory action to resolve issue not taken. 256 Fitzroy Street, PID 345348. Warning posted on October 16th, 2023. Pictures taken. Satisfactory action to resolve issue not taken. 
76 Sydney Street, PID number 338087. Warning posted on September 28, 2023. Pictures taken. Satisfactory action to resolve issue not taken. 103 Brackley Point Road, PID number 396200. Warning sent by registered mail to owner on September 28, 2023. Pictures taken. Satisfactory action to resolve issue not taken. In accordance with the terms of the dangerous, hazardous, and unsightly bylaw of the City of Charlottetown. Okay, all those in favor? Anybody opposed? Councillor Buck. Uh, in favor. Okay, that was unanimous, thank you. Protective and Emergency Services Committee, resolution number two, moved by Councillor Kevin Ramsey, seconded by Councillor Norman Beck, be it resolved that the Public Works Manager be authorized to remove derelict vehicles as determined under the dangerous, hazardous, and unsightly bylaw by definition at the owner's expense on properties located at 103 Brackley Point Road, PID number 396200 and 37 Cortland Street Road, PI, Cortland Street Road, PID 573592 in accordance with the terms of the dangerous, hazardous, and unsightly bylaw of the City of Charlottetown. I'm not sure it's street and road, but. <laughs> Resolution number two. Question? Question called. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? Councillor Back. In favor. Okay, that was unanimous. And we are now on to resolution number three. The final resolution is moved by Councillor Kevin Ramsey, seconded by Councillor Norman Back. Be resolved that the Council approve the sole source purchase of replacement rescue gear as approved in the 2023-2024 capital budget at a cost of $329,153, taxes included. And that the Mayor and CAO are hereby authorized to execute standard contracts and agreements to implement this resolution. Resolution on the floor. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? Councillor Beck? In favor. Okay, that was unanimously supported. Okay, any new business? Can I have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor McKinnon. All those in favor? Have a wonderful evening, folks.